What's up guys, it's Matt, the Fruitful Investor. Look, I don't know if you know this, but over 90% of self-made millionaires have done so through real estate investing. No, it hasn't been through e-commerce, hasn't been from selling on Amazon, not through stocks, definitely not from crypto, and not from small mom and pop businesses either. 90% of self-made, keyword, self-made millionaires have done so through real estate investing. Why? It's tried and true. It's been around for literally thousands and thousands of years. If we think back to the earliest times when we started building structures, there were owners of that land and owners of that structures renting it out to other people for a profit. Now, it might not look like it does today with modern leases and direct deposit payments from banks and stuff, but they were definitely renting out their land and spaces and structures for an exchange of payment, whether it was bread, coins, gold, money, whatever it was, but they were renting out their space. So real estate is tried and true. It's been around for thousands of years and it is not going anywhere, which is why I really, really love real estate. So if you're new to this channel, if you don't know me, my name is Matt Piche. I'm a real estate investor. I've owned over 45 individual rental properties. I've raised over $50 million, all from social media and videos doing like this to buy real estate with. And I've also flipped over a hundred single family homes. So in this video, we're doing a long video today. We're doing a masterclass, everything from A to Z on how to invest in real estate. I'm gonna give you everything I can from all my courses, all my videos, I'm gonna try and, and condense it as much as I can to give it to you in a couple hours. Let's see how long it goes. So get your coffee, get your lattes, get your popcorn, get your snuggy blanket, whatever you gotta do to relax and dive into this video. And let's chill, man. Let's just chill out and learn about real estate investing. So the first thing you wanna do when it comes to real estate investing is get clear on your ideal lifestyle and we'll come back to this in a sec and ideal niche for real estate investing. So, so this is very, very important. If you follow me, if you here on my YouTube channel, you know, I'm all about specializing, I'm trying to straighten this out. I don't know what's going on here. Um, I'm all about specializing and getting super, super clear on what I want from my real estate investing and what kind of niche I'm gonna specialize in. And this will all wrap around, you're gonna see why in the next hour or so, why it's super, super important to specialize. Man, I really gotta fix this before this falls down. All right, <laughs> so the first thing we got is what kind of real estate even is there? So we'll start with, first and foremost, single family. I think everybody knows you know, a bit about this. I'm sure you live in a single family home just like I do. So we kind of get what's going on here. All right, now we got this fixed, <laughs> we're straight. All right, so single family properties, we'll go over the pros and cons of each kind of specific niche and kind of give you an idea if you don't know much about what you want to do yet, what, what direction you want to go. I think this is really, really going to help. So single family, the pros are it attracts the highest quality. And by the way, guys, my writing is terrible. You're in for a long haul here, but just listen to what I'm saying. So the highest quality tenant, that's for sure. That's why I personally specialize with single family from the very beginning. And I still do to this point because for me, I want quality tenants. I don't want people skipping on rent, breaking the walls, smashing toilets, letting to toilets overflow and all this stuff. Trust me, <laughs> I've been through it all. Uh, terrible things have happened. So that's why I personally like to stick mostly with single family. It has the highest quality tenants, like I said. Um, they're more career oriented, so the tenants themselves, they're more career based, um, they're family based, going off a of career. So, you know, mom and dad have a job, they have two kids. Um, they definitely want to raise those kids right and you know provide a happy home and a good lifestyle so they're more focused on going to work every day to pay for the house to keep a roof over their head and keep them happy so you get where I'm going with this um, so th these tenants are, are really awesome they also stay for a long time now as you'll see when we get into the other niches you might not want them to stay so you can kick them out and raise the rent. If you're in an area like I am in Canada Canada pretty much is super super tenant friendly against land, uh, landlords, so they favor the tenant the most. So there's a bunch of laws in my area where like we can't kick tenants out for any reason. Uh, we can't raise the rent to you know whatever we want, no matter how good the house is or if we did renovations. There's only a certain amount of rent we can raise in my area per year, and the max is 2.5% per year, and the government dictates how much we can raise that rent. So you know inflation, like at the time of this video, inflation is going through the roof, but I can only raise the rent 2.5%. So, so for me, you know, I'm playing the long game. Um, you know, let, let these tenants stay a while. They're, they're super reliable. So I'm okay with giving up some cash flow in exchange for a good quality tenant. Vice versa, if you're into other niches, which we'll get into in a sec, you might want your tenants to leave every single year or way faster. And there's other real estate property types where that can happen. So anyway, so that's one con, I guess, is that they stay. One positive is that they stay long, so it's boring, it's easy. Um, actually, one of the biggest pros, I just said it, is boring. 
Um, so, but the con is that they stay for a long time. Maybe a con is, that is boring. <laughs> Maybe you want more variety, more stuff going on. Um, what else is there for cons? That's about it for cons. Uh, one of the biggest pros as well is that the tenant pay down is, is consistent. Uh, the equity gain, like the appreciation is consistent. Single family homes appreciate the fastest. Why? People want a single family home. You're like anybody can buy a single family home. A person who wants to just live in it with their kids and family, they can buy it, rent it. Um, an investor can also buy and rent it. So it's kind of open to everyone. Where we get to the other niches, they're more investor specific and only investors really buy those properties. So that's one of the gains as well as that it appreciates the fastest. Um, what other con can I think off the top of my head? They stay the longest, it's boring, uh, no rent increases. So like I said, because they stay for a while, um, you can't really raise the rents too often unless you live in a very landlord friendly state like Florida or Texas, maybe there's more opportunity for that. Um, I guess slow, this is a very slow um, plan. So like th the game plan for single family is really time. Time is your best friend. So five years, 10 year plan, 15 year plan, you're, you're gonna do amazingly well if you own a single family property. Um, that could be a con though, because it takes so long to really get rich or wealthy from single family. But the game plan for this is to have multiple single family homes, which I'll get to so much in this video, but that's the game plan for single family. So those are the pros and cons, the high level ones I can really think of off the top of my head. Next up, we got multifamily. And by the way, guys, if you see me looking down, it's I got my notes right here. I don't want to miss anything for you guys. So uh, multifamily, again, we'll do the pros. We'll just keep this line going. Uh, pros are much higher cash flow. So if cash flow is your biggest game plan, let's say you want to retire as soon as possible in the next year, two, three years, five years, um, multifamily might be a better case for you, whereas single family really, really might not be. This is definitely a long-term strategy. So if, you're, if you want to retire ASAP, you, you hate your job, you hate the direction of where your life is going and you want to retire, this might not be the best for you, but you might be in, interested in multifamily instead. Uh, so pros are higher cash flow, uh, business based. And by the way, I have a whole detailed like hour video on my channel about multifamily. So if this is kind of ringing true for you. Definitely check that video out. We'll put it in the description below. It's one of my most popular videos um, because I really get into the business details. So the business aspect is a huge pro because single family is boring. Like I said, at, like everyone knows how to do it. You know, you buy a, a, a residential home in a nice area. You put a good tenant in it. You renovate it really well. Easy peasy. Everybody kind of gets that. But with multifamily, it is way more business oriented. You can't just do that. It is way more about um, cap rates, which I can get into a bit in this video, but that other video I said is way more detailed. So it's, and it's the, the valuation of the building is way more based around cash flow and income. Whereas the valuation of single family is purely based on aesthetics. How good does it look? What kind of area is it in? Location, location, location. All the things we kind of know about from real estate investing. Multifamily kind of flips that on its head. All that doesn't matter. If you have a nice building and it looks amazing, every unit is renovated amazingly well, you have good tenants in there, but they're paying low rents. Maybe they've been there for 30 years, 20 years. We all know those tenants who stay in buildings that long, or you just don't know what you're doing or you're buying a building from a landlord that doesn't know what they're doing and the rent is so low. It doesn't matter that the building is nice and gorgeous and amazing. If it has a low income, it has a low valuation. People aren't gonna pay the price you want or what it's actually really worth because the income coming through is very low. This is more of a business-based oriented uh, uh, asset class. So one of the cons is kind of, I would say, is that it's business or I would say, pro savvy like it, this is really meant for savvy investors so if you're a first-time investor you can get into multifamily. you can buy a sixplex 12plex 20plex building that that'd be pretty sweet but majority of the time most people start with single family or the other real estate niches i'll talk about um, and multifamily kind of comes later when you're more of a savvy real estate investor and you know exactly what you're doing and you're you've now become more business-based because if you make a mistake in here in this asset class Okay, it, it can be really bad news. You're dealing with usually millions of dollars, million dollar buildings. Whereas if you, if you make a mistake with single family, it's very forgiving. I'm gonna add that here. Uh, it's a very forgiving asset class. For example, if you overpay on a single family property, for example, what we've just gone through for the past two or three years, a boom market for sure across North America, now we're seeing a dip, right? So, but if you overpay back in January, February, 2022, and you bought at the peak, that sucks. It's gone down in value a, a little bit. 
who cares? Hold on to it three to four, five more years. I promise you, you're gonna be way more positive. We'll be, we'll be past all time highs, that is for sure. That is what is uh, predicted right now anyway. So, and that's how single family works. It goes up and down, up and down, but more on an upward motion. So it's very forgiving. If you over renovate and you spend a little too much, like I said, no big deal. Just wait a little longer, wait for appreciation to catch up, to cover your butt, no problem. The tenants are kind of more forgiving because they're higher quality. Uh, this is way less forgiving. So really geared more towards um, really high investor quality type investors. Next up, we got student properties. So keep going here with the pros and cons. Student properties are the pro is super high cash flow. So we got super high cash flow because uh, we got four, five, six, seven <laughs> student. Uh, students in one house all paying usually around 500 bucks a month rent that's kind of like the minimum or the industry standard so if you have five tenants all paying 500 bucks a month and you have a single family home that you could just do a single or a, a long-term rental with but you're putting in five students you're jacking that cash flow way more the single family home in the last example i just said might rent for 1500 bucks that same house but if you jam five students in it's not renting for 2500 bucks so it's the same house same everything but you're jacking up the rent so way more cash flow um, that's about it for, for the pros because there are a lot of cons, I would say, with students. But I know a lot of people who are very successful with student rentals. Again, I would say this is slightly more investor focused. If this is your first run at real estate, I probably wouldn't recommend investing in student properties. Uh, the cons are students. <laughs> students slash parties. Okay, so we all know what students do. They're 18, 19 years old. It's the first time they've been away from, from mom and dad. They're, they're chilling out away from home with their friends. What do you think they're gonna do? Okay, so they're partying. There's more likely for damage, right? Not always. I'm kind of generalizing and painting a broad brush about students, but <laughs> this happens more than just sometimes. It happens quite often. And that's just the business of student property. So they're breaking things. They're messy. You're doing renovations. More often, um, one of the pros are that they leave every single year, generally. They're, they're moving out every single year. You're getting a, a new set of, of tenants in. The con is they leave every single year. It's a pain in the butt. You're always working, always hustling, always looking for more tenants. Yes, you can pass it off to a property manager for sure, just like all of these properties, so they can deal with it. But you're still um, speaking with the property manager. You're still kind of in the business, you're still getting intel about what's going on. So this is more of an investor uh, type asset class and more of an active business, whereas the other ones could have been a little more passive. Next up, kind of the last one I'm gonna share here, and there's more. We got commercial, we got all kind of land, mobile homes, but we won't get into that because the majority of people are gonna do these, whatever, we got four asset classes. So we got Airbnbs. My marker is dying already. Perfect. <laughs> right at the beginning of the video. So uh, Airbnbs, again, I would say the highest cash flow of all. Again, we're buying that usually that single family home in a nice area in the right location for an Airbnb. So maybe closer to a downtown core in a vacation area close to water, i.e. probably Florida, California, stuff like that. More generally, more uh, vacation type areas. However, you can do Airbnbs pretty much anywhere in North America. And a lot of my clients and myself, we're actually buying them in our own little town. So you can do Airbnbs pretty much anywhere, but generally it's more geared for vacation type areas. But the cash flow is absolutely insane. For example, if I buy that, that single family in my area, which is Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, I can buy that, that single family rental. Maybe it's a detached house, it rents for 2000, but I can do an Airbnb on it. And surprisingly, there are a ton of people that need an Airbnb in Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. If you, if you no idea where that is, I'm one hour south of Toronto, nothing really going on. It's an hour from Toronto. You would think who's gonna rent there for Airbnbs? A lot of people. And that's, <laughs> that's working across all of Canada and America for sure. But uh, that $2,000 rental for long-term tenant, I can get, four, five, six, ten thousand dollars a month. I know it sounds insane. We can get up to ten thousand dollars a month in income from that Airbnb. It's the same property. We just furnish it and ch change it to an Airbnb. So it's absolutely crazy. Th those are the pros for sure. Um, that's probably really the only pro on top of everything else from single family that we talked about. Cons are way more business oriented 
uh, if I can spell business, <laughs> can't spell business, and uh, way more active as well. So this is a very, very active style business. You're working in it, you're working with the property managers, you're adjusting the listings. It's always about taking quality pictures, quality videos, scheduling cleaners, it's a whole entire thing. I can spend hours and hours talking about each individual niche here and how to kill it, which we will on the YouTube channel with tons of videos, but this one I'm kind of making a general overall sweet video for you guys. So Airbnb is one of the cons are it's more business, more active. Um, I would say damage as well, because it does happen actually surprisingly often. Uh, again, you're dealing with vacationers, they're getting wild, <laughs> they're doing some things, they're breaking stuff, whatever. It happens all the time, so you're constantly fixing things up. Uh, it's kind of like a student rental vibe, but I would, I would say not as bad as this, that's for sure. But you're dealing with things, this is a business, it's a hotel kind of. So people are stealing stuff, they're stealing your lamp, they're stealing your soap, whatever, right? Stealing whatever they want. Um, so that happens quite often. So you're, you're always on it, you're always more active. So that's the one thing I would say. Next up, so we talked about specializing in a specific niche. So let's circle back and kind of go over it because this is very important before we go on. You need to pick whatever niche you want to focus on and it's gonna lead us for the rest of this masterclass in this video. So single family, the pros are highest quality tenant. These tenants are more career oriented. They're more family based. They stay for a while. They raise the kids. They got the roots, cats and the dogs. They're staying for years and years and years. Cons are they stay for a while. If you want to get more, uh, more tenants in and raise the cash flow, well, if they stay for a while in a lot of jurisdictions, you can't just raise the rent. Those are the rules. A lot of the world right now is more tenant friendly and there's rules around that. Um, and it's a very slow, slow growing asset but it is consistent. So it's consistent on the one side, but it's very, very slow on the other side. Multifamily, way more higher cash flow. It's more savvy. It's more income based. We're running a business here. And that's the biggest one of the cons is that as pro, pro investor, one of the cons I will say is that it has a low quality tenants. I, I forgot to say that. Uh, so the, these tenants, and the reason is they're paying less rent. So that, that's one key. The lower the rent, generally, the lower the quality of the tenant. Why? They're not career as career focused, likely. Again, I'm painting a brush here, but it's generally true. The lower the rent, they're, they're not really career focused. Um, maybe they're younger, so they're more likely to leave often. They're just kind of bouncing around, figuring out their life. So they're not really the best quality tenants if you want boring, boring, boring. Single family, obviously their family's putting down roots, they're staying for a while. So multifamily generally is like that. Student properties. Pros are super high cash flow. The tenants leave very often. So if you are in a pro tenant jurisdiction, well, they leave every year. So you can jack that rent up to whatever the hell you want in most cases. The cons are it's uh, much more investor focused. Tenants are breaking stuff. They're having parties. You know the drill there. Airbnbs, incredibly high cash flow. One of the cons is it's very, very heavily advanced. I would say an advanced investor, don't get into Airbnbs on your first property. You can, you definitely, if you have the right help, the right mentors, which I'll talk about in this video, definitely can, but it's less likely that you're gonna do that. More probably your third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth property is when you're gonna get into Airbnb. So let's talk about the lifestyle now because we talked about which niche to focus on. I gave you a generalization of each niche, one of the top niches you're probably gonna invest in. Two is lifestyle. So a lot of people don't talk about this. Let's get a little hippy dippy here. A lot of people just talk about, let's just get into real estate. Let's just buy cash flow. What's the highest cash flow property? I don't care what it is. I don't care where it is. I'm just gonna buy it. Well, to me, I like to focus, specialize, like I said, in one niche, but I also like to take into account what lifestyle do I wanna live? You know, I, I don't wanna just grind until I'm 50 years old, 60 years old. I wanna have a plan here and an ideal lifestyle that I'm chasing towards, that I'm going towards, and let's see how real estate can fit into that plan and get me to that lifestyle. So a lot of people don't talk about this. I've never really seen it, but I talk about it a lot. I've been talking about it for years. So let's go back again. So the single family properties is more passive. That's, oh, we're going way back here. I don't know where we are now. <laughs> we'll just go over it. Single family properties is more passive. It's boring, it's slow. It allows you to live your life. Uh, you're not really heavily invested in the business so much. It kind of takes care of itself. If you hire the right people, the right managers, the right property managers, Everything kind of takes care of itself. I know this because I've owned over 45 individual rental properties and it took me like no time. Like I spent, I don't know, a half an hour to an hour a month dealing with emails or just dealing with the properties themselves because I had the right team and the right team members in place taking care of absolutely everything. The only thing I did really was uh, overlook the taxes at the end of the year. But I'm not saying it's easy and anybody can do that like this. Okay, I've been doing this for 12 years and now I got the system in place. So at the beginning, I guess I spent way more time in it, 
but you can get to a point where you spend very, very, very little time. And that's true for kind of all these niches, but it's especially true for the single family niche. So if you're looking for more passive, you're on the beach, you, you don't wanna deal with issues, you wanna spend time with your family and do other things, maybe have other businesses, uh, single family real estate investing can definitely allow you to do that. Multifamily investing is true as well. You can get uh, property managers, you can get your team in place where you spend very little time, but I, I would say you're getting more emails, you're getting more things to you because there's a lot more going on. If you have a, a 20 unit building, <laughs> that's the equivalent of me having 20 properties. So if you have six buildings and each one has 20 units on average, okay, you got a lot going on. There's more likely that you're gonna be spending more time in your business. So if you're okay uh, trading a little bit more time in exchange for a way higher monthly cash flow, then that niche absolutely might be for you. So if you wanna travel the world and do whatever you want, spend time with your family, but you're okay spending five, 10 hours a week tending to your real estate investing business, that's a more likely scenario of what's going to happen. So that's the difference between single family and multifamily right there. Student properties, I would say it's very similar to the multifamily business. You can still get all your team members in place to, to, to uh, take care of that. And we'll talk about that kind of in the next session of who has to be on your team. But again, it's a more active style business. Um, I would say you're, you're spending more time in the business as well. Five to 10 hours a week, probably at the highest, best running level. Uh, Airbnbs, I would say way more active. So this is for the person who loves to work, loves to be in the business, loves to trade time in exchange for very, very high cash flow and high income. Yes, for all of these, you can get team members and we'll talk about that, who to hire, have employees on the team, that's for sure. But the Airbnbs, now we're getting into that more active, um, savvy investor role. So way more, way more time and effort and it's, it's a constantly changing industry as well. So with the single family and the multifamily specifically and students, we can just set it and forget it. That's a tried and, te tried and true, tested thousands of year um, strategy. We, we know it, buy the property, renovate it really well, stick a good tenant in there, pass it out to your property manager and the employees, we're good. Nothing's gonna change in the next 100 years with this niche. There's no like fashion trends with this. There's, there's no trend uh, changing. It's, it's gonna be there. 100 years from now, that's for sure. Airbnb is a very ever-changing market. The rules are changing around every jurisdiction all the time. Uh, we have COVID and Corona and all these things happening that shut down the vacation industry, all these things. It's a very, very changing thing. I would kind of compare it to like a stock market strategy. It's very active, it's changing every single day and you gotta be on top of everything. So if you're okay with exchanging some family time or some quiet time for way more cash flow. So if you're a very go-getter person, you love to work hard, long hours, this can be for you and you will be rewarded very, very, very well. So have you decided which niche you're gonna specialize in? Single family, multifamily, student properties, or Airbnbs? Let's get to the next section. All right guys, so you've chosen which niche you're gonna specialize in. If you haven't chosen it just yet, because I'm putting you on the spot, no worries. <laughs> We can just work through it, just keep thinking about it and we'll keep going on. But you've chosen the niche you wanna specialize in and you've chosen kind of your ideal lifestyle, you've thought about what you want for your life and how you want your real estate business to fit into it. Now we have to choose an area to really specialize in. And I think I'm gonna change my pen here pretty soon. <laughs> so specialize in one area. There we go, if I push hard, the ink goes better. So. Very, very important. This is the most important part of this entire video, I think, and I've said it, I don't know, a million times on my channel here in all my videos. I'm all about specializing, as I've already said so many times, in one specific niche, and now one specific area. So one of the biggest mistakes investors do is they just buy anything and everything anywhere. So if I'm living in Kitchener-Waterloo, for example, I get emails all the time from realtors, investors, hey Matt, you, you should buy this deal in Toronto, which is an hour away. You should buy this deal over here, it's three hours away. You should buy this deal all the way in America, in Tennessee, because there's a great deal here. Okay, there's great deals everywhere, but if you're always chasing, you're not really specializing, you're not becoming an expert, and it's the whole entire crux, this entire video is being an expert and specializing, you're gonna find out why. But specializing in one area is absolutely key, because it lowers the amount of mistakes you can make. Every single market is a little bit different. So if you're investing over here, over there, you're forgetting what rules are you know, associated with this area, you're forgetting the market, you're forgetting the streets. Um, it's very, very tough 
to grow and just own an area and to grow your business. You're gonna find out exactly why that is. So for me, I specialize in one area. So how do you decide an area? You're probably thinking, Matt, how do I pick the right area? I have no idea what you're talking about. How do I know if my area is good? Here's the thing that I learned from the very beginning from very, very smart people. The first thing you wanna focus on um, is GDP growth. This is absolutely everything. So if you don't know what GDP is, that's gross domestic product. It's basically the output of goods and services in one area. So how much is an area producing basically? So if you, have an, if you find an area with good GDP growth, and what we wanna do is find the national average of GDP, and we wanna find the state, if you're in America, or if you're in Canada like I am, the province average. So let's just say the GDP growth nationally is uh, two to 3% a year, which is kind of normal for Canada and America. And then you wanna find a state or province that's exceeding that. So maybe we got a Florida, which is really exceeding the national average, that's for sure. Maybe Florida is putting out a four to 5% output of GDP growth every single year. And then we wanna boil it down to a city. So maybe we got Miami. I don't know if this is true or not. Don't, I'm just going off of stuff that everybody knows. Everyone knows Florida, everyone knows Miami. Uh, these numbers aren't accurate, they're theoretical. But let's just say Miami has a 6% GDP growth every year. It's really growing, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, so that's what we want. We wanna go to the national average, find out what that is, state or province, okay, cool. Now what's the fastest city growing in that area specifically? And you're drilling down to find the best area. So the GDP growth is most important, why? If an area has good GDP growth that's exceeding the state and the national average, this is gonna lead to job growth. You're gonna see the basic logic of how this works. Why? If we have GDP growth, well, it must lead to job growth. If an area is growing and exporting and has all these services and all these things going on, it has to lead to job growth. Okay, so why is job growth important? Well, you want your tenants to have a job so that you pay your rent. Or if you're flipping, you wanna have buyers who have money. They have a job, they have money to buy your product. You wanna be investing in Areas that have nothing going on. So some small town in Idaho or like West Virginia, okay? I'm not knocking those states, great states. I've been to both of them. <laughs> so, but you see what I'm saying? You don't wanna be investing in the boonies where there's nothing going on, there's no industries. So if we have good job growth, we're also looking for a diverse um, industry. And we see we can just keep drilling down so much into each little thing. So we want a diverse industry. So example, uh, one, one reason why Miami might not work is that it's, like 90% tourism. Now, Miami does work, because I've looked there and we are investing there, so Miami is a pretty good place to invest, not financial advice, but you see what I'm saying. It is way more, uh, it's kind of a one industry pony. And th that is a risk of Miami. Let's say we're investing in Michigan. Um, it is obviously very heavily automotive focused in most towns around the Rust Belt, right? So it's very automotive industry, so that's good in, in the boom cycle for what we've seen for the past three or five years. That's really good. Everybody's working, everybody's a job, factories are producing things, but now the cycle's changing and we're going to possibly in a recession. Uh, we'll see what's gonna happen. So in those times, those one industry ponies, specifically automotive heavy areas, they tend to do bad unless they have other industries to pick up the load. So that's why we wanna look for a place that's a diverse industry. So for example, in my town here, it's very diverse. I'm one hour from Toronto, so we have, we have Toronto, which isn't too far away. If you believe it, a lot of people commute every day to work to the big city in Toronto. It's crazy that they drive an hour each way, but hey, so we have that. <laughs> we also have a lot of, I'd say about 40% of my area is factory-based, so manufacturing, which is really good because they do really well in the boom cycle. Not so much in the in recessions, but decently well because we have a diverse um, manufacturing sector here as well. We also have a lot of big insurance companies, so that does well in all cycles. Obviously, everybody needs insurance, so we have a lot of big employers there. We have a lot of universities. In my town, there's three universities and one major college, so education provides a ton of jobs that do well all year long or all cycles, recession, boom, etc. You see where I'm going. So that's why I chose my area of Kitchener, Waterloo, uh, Ontario, Canada. By the way, if you're watching this video and you're in Ontario and you want to invest in Kitchener Waterloo, I am a realtor specializing only with investors. You probably already knew that if you're a follower here, but hit me up if you want to invest in my area. But you want to find a diverse area that has good job growth. Why? Job growth leads to uh, increased rental demand. Now, why is that? 
if there's a lot of new jobs or just a lot of consistent jobs, when people are gonna move to that area, I skipped one actually. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Pretend I didn't say that. We have population growth. Once you have a lot of job growth, you have a lot of population growth. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of jobs, a lot of people move into that area to be part of those jobs. What happens when a lot of people move to an area? I gave it away. <laughs> Rental demand increases, why? When people move to a new area for a new job, they're less likely to buy a house right away. Now they may do that, some may do that, but a lot of people are gonna rent there for a little bit. See if they even like the job, see if they even like to live in that area. So they're more likely to rent. And that being said, I, generally 50 to 60% of all people are renters anyway. So there's always a ton of renters, but a lot of people specifically rent in a new area to figure out if they even wanna be there, right? So that leads to an increase in rental demand, more people moving in, supply and demand economics come into play. If there's only limited inventory or so much inventory and way more people are moving to the area because of all the jobs, it's gonna lead an increase. Landlords are gonna get greedy and say, ooh, I have 10 people looking to, to rent this place. Who can pay the most? And up and up and up the rents go. That's just basic supply and demand of, on economics. So if we have an increase in rental demand, what always comes next is an increase in real estate prices. This is kind of the top, and by the way, this is like the top of the boom phase. So in real time, this is what we just saw play out um, January, February of uh, 2022. This was the top of this cycle for sure. A lot of GDP growth for the past couple of years, lots of job growth, everybody moving to these sweet areas, rents were climbing, real estate is climbing, now we hit the boom. And what happens is, if I can draw a small one, <laughs> pretend this is here. Okay, now the cycle starts to do this. Okay, so real estate prices start falling, rents start falling, people start getting fired from their jobs, so uh, job growth starts going down, GDP growth starts going down. We just had two negative quarters of GDP in America. Okay, so GDP is going down, so we could be somewhere between here in the cycle already. That was, it was a quick six months. This took about six, eight years the, the way up always takes longer. The way down, much faster. There's a saying out there that uh, the bears take, sorry, the bulls take the stairs up and the bears take the elevator down. Okay, so bulls are bullish. That means good, market going up. Bears are bearish. That means bad. They want the market to go down. So <laughs> bulls take the stairs up, bears take the elevator down. Way faster. So it kind of looks like this. And then we kind of go up again, slowly, slowly, slowly for the next eight, 10 years. So good time to buy. Right now, we're probably around here in a lot of areas. Okay, we're gonna go a little lower. Doesn't mean prices for real estate are gonna go lower, but economically, we probably are gonna go a little lower, and then we start buying again, and we ride the next eight, six, 10 years up wave. That's just how economics and how real estate cycles work. We'll talk about that in, later in this video about real estate cycles. So, we wanna find an area that's doing this for sure. So, and, and even in key cities, now you're probably thinking, well, Matt, if every city's gonna do this, you can't invest anywhere. You're, you're gonna get smacked everywhere. That's not true. If you're investing in good quality areas, good quality areas that have good job growth, good GDP growth, even in tough times, yeah, it might look, a, you know, it might go like this, but if you're investing in a small town in Idaho in the middle of nowhere, their chart gonna look like this, <laughs> right? So we can weather the recessions out, the tough times out in, better quality air. Real estate prices hold up better because there's more jobs, there's more diversity. Um, and that's, that's what I'm telling you to look for. Look for those areas. Don't be tempted to just buy anywhere because your friend John said, hey, you should buy here. Or Steve, the realtor said, hey, you should buy here. Trust me, I'm a realtor. This deal's a really good deal, even though it's three hours away. You can definitely do that. And I know a lot of investors, a lot of friends of mine uh, are super wealthy and they invest everywhere and anywhere. Um, and they're doing really well. So you can do that. It's just for me, I like to specialize and own one area. For example, when I started investing uh, back in 2011, I was very focused specifically on single family properties in Kitchener-Waterloo. Don't even talk to me about anything else. So a lot of people brought me deals in Guelph, which is 20 minutes uh, outside of my town. I was like, sorry, dude, I only invest in single family properties in Kitchener-Waterloo. Trust me, that's all I do. I don't have to tell you why. That's all I do, I'm sorry. Matt, there's a sweet deal in Toronto. No, I only buy single family properties in Kitchener-Waterloo. Matt, there's a sweet multifamily building in Kitchener-Waterloo. This is your town, it's a great deal. Sorry, I only buy single family properties 
in Kitchener Waterloo. That's how intense I was about specialization and not wanting to veer off of my path. And it served me very, very, very well because I made very little mistakes because the whole thing got boring and just repeatable. It was just like going to work every single day doing the most boring stuff. <laughs> I bought this house on these streets for this price and I renovated it like this and I got X. Easy peasy, I can do it over and over again in my sleep. And that's what I really recommend for you, especially at the beginning. Once you become more of a savvy investor and you're more successful and you made millions of dollars, now if you wanna go invest in other places, I get it, but, but now you have the foundation on how to do it again which is exactly what I'm doing right now in our business. You know, we've owned Kitchener Waterloo, I would say. I grew a, very big in this area. I made millions of dollars, have a, a pretty high net worth. Now we're going to Florida to do vacation properties, Airbnb properties. Kind of the opposite of single family, boring, don't bother me on the beach, easy peasy. And now I'm going down to do a very, very active and intense business, but I've grown over these past 12 years. I have a great foundation, a great business skill foundation. I have a great team. I know how to hire employees. So now it's way easier. It's kind of very easy for me to expand and do this. But if I would have done this back in 2012, 2013, when I was just a few years into real estate, taking on expanding to Florida would have been impossible or just not very smart. I would have made so many mistakes. I wouldn't know how to incorporate, how to work with lawyers, how to work with realtors. There's no way, there's no way it would have worked as smoothly as it is now. Our expansion down to Florida has been incredibly, incredibly uh, smooth. So why is important? So once you pick the area that you specialize in, you, you found it, you've done the research, you found the GDP growth growing faster than the national and provincial averages or state averages. Now you want to become the expert. So what does that mean exactly? We need to know the prices. So let's just say we're, we're let's, let's just stick with Miami. Everyone knows where Miami is. So let's say for this example, uh, I chose Miami, Florida. Okay, what are the prices for? And also I'm specializing in, let's just say single families, which there's not very much in this town, city, so this, <laughs> but there is, so it, it works, I guess. Okay, so what are the prices for the single family properties, the very few of them in, in Miami, Florida? Um, what are they selling for? So prices, let, let, let's just say, well, I did do a lot of research there, so about 500K for the average single family home. Let's just say for example. So 500K. So I need to know the exact prices on that very, on each street, maybe closer to the water, it's 500. Maybe the more I get in uh, inland, maybe they're more like 350, 400K. So you need to know all the streets, the neighborhoods, I'll just put hoods. You need to know all these numbers and not on demand for your realtor to figure out or to ask them or to punch into Google and figure it out. You need to know this in your head. Streets, when people say one, two, three Main Street, <laughs> let's just say, I got this house on Main Street, you know right away, ooh, I know it's gonna sell for this much money. I know it's gonna cost this much here. Um, I know the rents are gonna be 2,000, let's just say for, for this example. I know the rent on that street is gonna be 2,000. I know the rent on this street, more inland, is gonna be 1500 right away. You can't wait to talk to your realtor or figure it out. You're going to do that on your research on the way up. But when you're ready to act and start buying, I want you to get to the point where when someone says, I got this deal on this street in this neighborhood right away, it should, it should sell for X. It's going to rent for X and you know, the rental costs as well. If it's a piece of crap, you know, it's going to cost you uh, 80K to fully renovate, make it look sweet. If it needs a little bit of work, you know it's gonna cost you 60K. So you can run all these numbers in your spreadsheets, in your calculations, before you even go to the property. That's, that's the key. When the realtor sends you the deal, or you find the deal on the MLS, you know right away what the numbers are on top of your head, and then you can start acting and go to the house and just verify that it's true. Once you walk through the property, yes, it's true. It's gonna take 80. Oh no, I was slightly off. It's actually gonna be 90K. I'll adjust my numbers when I get home. When I do the renovations, I thought it was gonna rent for 1500, but it's a pretty nice area, a pretty nice street. Maybe I can get 1750 instead of 1500. All these things in your head, very, very quick. So when I was a realtor back in 2012 and still am, when I started, people were very, very thrown off that I was very young. At the time I was 22 years old as a realtor specializing only with investors. And I was this level of nerdy and specialization. So when I would bring people through properties and, and they would say, Matt, what if I did all the floors? 
you know, how much would that cost and how much would it rent for? I would know right away. It's gonna cost you 10 grand and it's gonna up the rent by 100 bucks. The total rent will be 1,500 bucks. That's crazy. Like, how'd you know that, Matt? I just do. So when I'm gonna go through other properties. If you flip it totally like this and you spend 90 grand, the valuation of that is gonna be worth this much when you're done. If you don't do it, it'll be worth this much, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the level of specialization you need. Don't wait for your realtors to tell you because they might be wrong, right? They might be wrong. They're just, a lot of realtors are just looking for a commission. We'll talk about very soon how to pick the right one, but you can't trust anybody, what they say. Even if they're specialized in what they do, you need to be more specialized than them when it comes to that area. That's the level I want you to get at. It takes time, but it's not hard. It's just looking at listings over and over and over again and going through the process and make mistakes on the way. But once you do this for one, two, three, four years, you're gonna get to a level of insane specialization and it's very, very important. I keep teasing you because uh, very soon you're gonna see why this level of specialization is game changing and the crux of your entire business depends on this. So speaking of teams, I've been teasing about realtors and stuff like that, who you gotta use. Number four, form your team. Now, if you wanna scale your business and be a successful real estate investor, the only way you can do that is if you have a good team set in place and a lot of people kind of working on your side. So number one, the most important person on your team absolutely needs to be a realtor and not just any realtor. This has to be an investment focused realtor. Very, very hard to come by. So for example, in my area of Kitchen Waterloo, not to brag, I am literally the only one. Now a lot of realtors in my area will say, I know investing, Matt. I know how to do it. I can be, pe I can help people invest. No, you can't. I only sell properties to investors. I do not sell John and Lucy's house with a white picket fence. I am all in and I'm an investor myself and people can see my credentials of how I invest on YouTube. So I, I don't need to talk about that, <laughs> but I'm a very high level investor. And it's all I do. You're looking for a very similar realtor that's out there that is very, very investment focused. It's hard to find one, not like me, I'm not bragging about myself, but why not? Uh, the odds of you finding another only real estate investor focused realtor anywhere in North America is probably gonna be tough, but they're out there. But it, if they're, as, it's just as long as they're mostly focused, I would say 80 to 90%. Uh, if they're gonna pick up a few other deals here to you know, supplement their income and grow their business, you can't fault them for that, I get it, right? But just for me, I'm all in, that's all I do. But if you can find a realtor that's 80, 90% focused only with investors, that's fantastic, that's good enough. As long as they're investors themselves, they've done what you wanna do, they've bought the properties that you wanna buy, they understand the business model, and they have a track record. So do not work with just any realtor. I'm telling you, please, just don't do it. Even if Lucy, your aunt, is a realtor and your mom's like, you better use your aunt Lucy as a realtor. Don't. You need to work with the right people. This is totally different than just buying your dream house or your family house. Okay, we're talking about your retirement, we're talking about hard earned money, especially if you're raising capital, which we'll talk about soon, and, and getting joint venture partners. You cannot be using any Joe Blow realtor, okay? Just please use investing folks. So, how do you find these people? First thing is join investor groups, join Facebook groups that are investor focused. Just ask other investors in your area that are successful that you know that you're networking with, hey, what realtor do you use? How long have you used them for? Um, do they invest themselves, et cetera? And then interview the realtor. That's the easiest way, so it's just referrals. Who have other investors in your area used? Um, good ways to find them are YouTube or just Googling and finding and looking at their Instagram or their social medias and just see, is it true? Are they actually investing or are they just a realtor looking for commissions? Um, this is the most important absolute person. Why? They're helping you through the whole transaction. They're most likely finding you the majority of the deals you're gonna buy. So if you don't have a good realtor that's sending you deals and you're, you can't find deals, means you're not buying properties, means you're not growing your business, which means you're not gonna be wealthy and live the lifestyle you want. So everything kind of comes back to this realtor. This is the absolute most, in person, most important person on your team. Switch my notes. Number two, we got the mortgage broker. 
And again, we want it to be investor focused as well. They don't have to be as crazy as the realtor. This is like the super important. They must be all in or mostly in. The mortgage broker is gonna do deals for all people because that's how mortgage brokers are. I haven't really found yet a mortgage broker that's solely investment focused. They tend to do kind of everything, but kind of the same deal. Are they investing in real estate themselves? Have they done a lot of the properties kind of that you're looking for? Um, are you getting referrals from other uh, investors in your, in your area? The reason why the mortgage broker must be investor focused is it's imperative to the growth of your business because for example, in Canada and America is true as well, but in Canada, you can only buy so many properties, especially single family properties. So six or five units and under is technically considered single family in the terms of mortgage. Six units or more is considered commercial or uh, investor focused. So the rules for financing are totally different between the two of them real quick, six and up multifamily buildings is more commercial. You can buy unlimited buildings. It's business based. The mortgage lenders on that side of the uh, aisle get it. They understand business. You can buy unlimited properties. Easy peasy. With five units or less. So if you're specializing in single family, small multifamily, student properties or Airbnbs, this applies to you. In North America, really, you can only buy so many properties before the banks say no. So in Canada specifically, um, it tends to be about four to five properties. The major banks, TD, RBC, Scotia, um, they all have these set rules where they say, if this individual owns five properties, no more mortgages for him, no more. Now you would think, okay, I'll do five with RBC. I'll do five with TD. I'll do five with Scotia bank. No, 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 no. They all talk to each other. They all have the deals. They all have the same things, same rules. If, they, if this person has five properties, give or take, depending on their income, fluctuates between four to six properties, depending how much money you have and how much income, doesn't even matter if you're a multimillionaire. Six properties, generally, the banks are gonna say no more. Unless you have a really creative mortgage broker who can kind of do some tricks, but there's, so many, there's only so many tricks you can do before the banks say no more. So this is very, very important to work with the right one because they can set you up as best as possible. Because if you just work with any mortgage broker and they just get you the best mortgage at that time, maybe you can only buy two properties because they set the mortgage orders they use the right, the wrong lenders in the wrong order at the wrong time. So it's very, very important. You work with the savvy broker and tell them what your plans are. Hey, I plan to buy 30 properties. They're going to be all single families. What's the best road I can take to get there to get me the most under my personal name before I got to start partnering with other people, which I will talk about very, very soon. So there's, those are the roadblocks you have in Canada. In America, it's a little more wild west, a little more capitalistic, which is what I really like. I'm a big capitalist, which is why we're expanding to the US, but very similar. So instead of maybe six properties, maybe it'll be eight, nine, 10 properties before the banks and the lenders talk to each other in America and say, this guy, no more mortgages for him. This girl, no more mortgages for her. She, she, she already has nine properties. She's seen as a bigger risk. I know it makes no friggin' sense. The more real estate you have, the higher your net worth. If all your properties are cash flowing, doing very, very well, and you've done a great job of building your business, it doesn't matter. The mortgage lenders see you as a giant risk because you own so much real estate. What if, what if something happens in the economy and she goes bankrupt? Now we have nine properties to foreclose on. It's too much of a risk. I'm not lying to her. It makes no sense. It's not how the world works. It's not how business works. It's not how capitalism works, but that's how the banks work. We'll talk about how to get around that with partners very, very soon. But long story short, use a mortgage broker who knows what you want to do, what you're investing in and the right mortgages to set you up at the right time to get you the most property possible before you hit that financing wall and you start dealing with the problems that I'm dealing with and every single major real estate investor is dealing with. Next person on your team you need to work with is a wholesaler. So kind of like a realtor who finds you the great deals on the MLS, a wholesaler finds you off MLS deals or off market deals. So they find deals direct from seller. So if you don't know what a wholesaler, I'll spend a little bit of time on this. Um, wholesalers find motivated sellers directly and they buy their properties at a huge discount. For example, if a realtor would find the same house, let's say it's a piece of crap house. It needs a lot of work uh, and they're going to sell it for 600 K. This is in my area, <laughs> a lot of money, 600 K for a total piece of crap fixer upper. 
The realtor is going to say, hey, we should list it for 600000 and get you the most possible money we can based on comparables, and you got to pay my commission, so I got to jack that price up to pay that 5 6% commission. <laughs> so I think I can sell it for you, Mr. Seller, at six hundred k as a realtor. Okay, so a wholesaler, what they're going to do is they're going to come in, maybe they've done marketing, they've done flyers. I'm sure you've seen the flyers in your mailbox that say, we buy houses, all cash, no commissions, I'll close whenever you want. Every wholesaler is the same. The business model is the same. I'm sure you've seen those flyers. That's a wholesaler. So they're marketing, Facebook ads, flyers, etc. to direct sellers who are more motivated. These people, these sellers tend to not want to list with a realtor. They're embarrassed because their house is usually insane, hoarder t style. They're embarrassed. They don't want their neighbors walking through or their family through, or they just don't want people they know about their house being on the market. They're just embarrassed. That, that's the majority of the time the sellers who work with wholesalers is because they're embarrassed. The house is insane. It just needs too much work, etc. Or they just hate realtors. They don't trust them. There's a lot of that as well. But anyway, a wholesaler will do, send out the marketing. A seller will call them and say, I want to sell my house. Same house, right? But a wholesaler comes in and he says, I'll buy this house for, let's just say like 480. Now you would think the seller would go, what the hell? I just had a realtor come through yesterday. He said I can get 600. And this is what they do often, sellers. And the wholesaler says, yes, I know, but I'm not charging you commission. So we'll take the five, 6% commission out of that. We'll start there. Um, and your house needs a lot of work and I'm not putting it on the market. We're not doing open houses. We're not doing showings. I'm going to buy it right here, right now, all cash. There's no conditions, no home inspection, no financing inspection. I'm buying it right here, right now, Mr. Seller, but I need a discount. It's got to be a good deal. So I'll buy it right here, right now at 480. Now you and me would probably go, well, that's dumb. I'm going to contact a realtor. I'm going to get the, I'm going to get more money as much as I can anyway. I'm going to sell it. But a lot of people don't have time for that. Maybe somebody passed away in their family, or like I said, they're embarrassed. They just don't want to list the house. So they're going to sell it to a wholesaler for 480. They're, they'll go fine. I'll give up that much money in exchange for fast. And we're going to sell it right now. And you're going to close on this house in two weeks. And the wholesaler says, yep, I'll close on it in two weeks if I can get it for this price. No problem. So the wholesaler locks up the deal. He does a contract, same contract as if you bought a house with a realtor. He's going to sign the contract with them right now for 480. But what they tend to do is also a clause in the offer that says I can assign it or sell it. Basically it's a fancy word for selling it. I can sell this offer to anybody I want. So a wholesaler will have an email list just like the realtor does basically, right? Cause the realtor sends you an email about the property. If you're on a wholesaler's list, They'll also send you a deal and say, Hey, I locked up one, two, three main street for 480 K it's worth 600 K on the market. We have comps. We can do comps too. You know, we have comps. It's worth 600 K. I bought it for 480. I'm going to sell it to you for 520. You're happy because it's worth 600 K you have comps. You asked your own realtor for comps or better yet. Like I said, remember you're a specialist yourself. You already know the prices in your head. You know, it's worth 600 K as it is. You're happy because you just bought it for 520. The wholesaler is happy because he bought it at 480, but he sold the contract to you for 520, which means he made 40 K, right? He bought it for 480. He sold it to you for 520. He's happy. You're happy. Seller's happy because they sold the house. No showings, no crap like that. Right? So this is why a wholesaler is very, very important too, because they can find you off market deals at discounts generally, and you can either flip it or hold it into, as a rental property, whatever you want to do with it, but you're buying it at a discount. So you want both of these people on your team, realtor and a wholesaler. You want all the deals, all the deals. And these deals are really good. But for the past three years with the giant boom cycle we've had, I'll be honest, the wholesaling deals haven't been that good. They've pretty much been a realtor deal. Cause the market was so friggin' hot. So many people want to get into real estate investing. Oh, it's so easy. I saw it on HGTV. You just buy it low, sell it high, renovate it, bing bangs, easy money, right? Well, so wholesalers were getting greedy for the past three years. I'll be honest. Now the tides are changing. The market is getting way different. The cycle's changing. Um, so a lot of people, a lot of wholesalers right now are ha actually having a hard time selling their deals. Just like anybody right now, houses aren't selling too much right now. So you're seeing the fees come down to more realistic things. So what I'm saying in a nutshell, you have to be more careful of wholesale deals uh, for the past three years. And a lot of people were just buying them because if a wholesaler had the deal, oh, it must be a good deal. It has to be. It's an off market deal. 
which means it's automatically a great deal, which means I'm gonna make a ton of money. It's not always true. Do your homework, and this is why it is absolutely important to be a specialist so you know it's a good deal and you're not getting hosed and taken advantage of by a wholesaler or a realtor or anybody, right? Next up on your team, we got a property manager. So obviously, don't need to talk too much about that. Property manager is absolutely important because you're growing a business. You're a real estate investor, you're savvy, you're growing a business. You don't have time to manage every individual property and that's what I would say is absolutely very important. Um, don't be managing your own properties. I get it at the beginning if you have one or two properties and you know, your small business. I would actually encourage you actually to manage your first one to three properties for the sole purpose of you realize how shitty it is and how quickly you need to hire a property manager and never do it again. So I want you to manage your first three properties to realize how, how crappy it is, okay? But after that, we hire property managers because we're building a business, it has to be automated as possible. Remember like I said, single family is very, very automated, very, very boring. Multi-family student property is a little less boring, but we wanna offload as much as we can to a property manager and have them deal with the phone calls of the tenants or the, the toilet's not working, the tap's not working, I'm not paying rent this month. Like you want them to deal with all that crap so you can focus on growing your business, raising capital to buy more properties or just spending time with your family, okay? Business takes care of itself, that's the ideal scenario, and you're spending more time doing whatever you want. Like that's what I'm sure you want is to do whatever you want, right? That's the whole reason why we're investing in real estate and investing in general so we can live our life on our terms and we have money to, to do that, right? Okay, so property manager, I don't need to spend too much time on that. That's kind of self-explanatory. Last person on the team, and there's many more, but the most important top five here, uh, your contractor. So absolutely important to have a good contractor on the team. They're the ones doing all the renovations. Without a good contractor, you can't renovate your properties very well. If you can't renovate your properties very well, they're not selling for flips and they're not renting very well for long-term rental. So the contractor is, I put him at number five here at the bottom, but he's kind of number two. Very, very important. Um, and the way I find good contractors, because I'm sure you're thinking, Matt, how do I find a good contractor? How do I get a good person on my team? Um, the best thing is just like I said for the uh, referrals for the realtors and the mortgage brokers. Ask other investors in your area, who are they using for contractors? They've, they're proven with them, they've used them before, they know what they're doing. Um, so get referrals. If you can't find a referral, which is the best, you can go on Craigslist, Kijiji, Facebook, and look for contractors. Obviously you have no referral from that, so you're kind of going off your gut. Um, what I always say is trust your gut. Very, very, very important. Your gut is the most important. I'm sure you know when you meet someone whether they're gonna screw you over or not. I'll be honest, every single time a contractor screwed me over, which they have multiple times, every single time I got screwed by contractors because I didn't trust my gut. I knew from the very moment I met them, this person's gonna screw me. They're, they're just selling off about them, I don't really trust them, but I need this flooring job done so fast, I just need you to do it, and then they screwed me. So <laughs> trust your gut, most important, do interview process, see some pictures, uh, but like I said, very, very important to get referrals from other investors. Now, the more you do this, the more years you're in the business, the more you'll know what to look for. And for me, I had a slight advantage because I am a contractor myself. I was a carpenter, I did my whole apprenticeship, I did the whole thing. I had my own business, ren uh, renovating properties before I became a realtor. So I know what tradesmen are like, I know what to look for, I know the signs of a good tradesman and a not good tradesman. So I had a slight advantage off the get-go but you will learn this the more you do this. Yes, you will get screwed by contractor eventually. It will happen, get ready for it. It's just part of the business, part of life, but it'll give you good knowledge on how to not get screwed the next time. All right, so number five, buying your property. I think I'm gonna switch this pen right now. Sorry guys. We got the little guy now. Buying your, oh yeah, way better. First property. Okay, so. You've chosen the area, you found the right area with the good GDP growth, good job growth, good population growth, increasing rental demand. You found the area, you know what you're looking for, you've chosen single family properties in Miami, now you're buying your first property and you need to tell your realtor kind of what you're looking for. So you've told them I want these properties in this area because you've researched the neighborhood. So you're saying in this part of town, I want these houses to be sent to me 
for this price range. Um, it needs this much amount of work. You're telling your realtor what you want. You're the boss. You're telling them what you want and they're sending you the right deals of what you're looking for. And then what you're looking for when you actually walk to the property, because now they're sending you all these deals, what I recommend looking for, because it's easy to do all the theoretical work up to this point, now you're getting excited and you're saying, Matt, but what do I look for when I get to the property? It's easy to do all the other work. What am I looking for when I walk through these deals? So first thing I like to look for when I walk through any house is the foundation. Now, this is a terrible example now that I'm thinking about it because Miami and Florida, they don't really have two-story houses. <laughs> Florida's mostly bungalow slab on grade, so there is no foundation. It's just concrete on the ground. But let's say we're buying properties more east and north in America or Canada. We have a lot of two-story houses. So there's a foundation here about this high, concrete foundation. So you really, really need to look for this because uh, any leaks or foundation problems, or now that I've drawn it, the house is leaning a bit. <laughs> These are the things I'm looking for when I walk through house. First thing, I go to the basement, I always start in the basement, and I work my way up when I'm going through a house. Um, if that basement is finished, like right now, I'm in my basement, looks pretty sweet, right? Okay, I'm in my basement, uh, it's all finished. I can't see the foundation walls because it's all drywalled. What I'm looking for if it's drywalled is the smell. If a basement is musty smelling, I'm sure you've walked down in a basement before that's musty and gross, that is a good sign that there's a, a water issue, there's water getting in, or the foundation is absorbing water at the very least, which is eventually gonna lead to potentially more physical leaks when the house gets older, okay, and starts cracking, especially in the colder climates. I'm in Canada, very, very cold winters, um, and cold and concrete do not do well, okay? So water gets in or on the foundation, it freezes, the water expands, it's basic science, Water expands, it starts cracking the foundation, and then in the springtime when the snow melts, okay, the water is getting through into the basement. Very, very awesome science thing I just said there. Okay, so very, very important. Foundation, if the house is leaning, if I can see the foundation, if it's empty, um, if it's unfinished, sorry, are there cracks in the walls? Is the house leaning? Which I can tell if I'm walking upstairs, and if, the, if it kind of feels like I'm doing this when I'm walking upstairs, it's a good sign there's a foundation issue. One key note though, if you're buying older homes built in 1940s, 50s, the house is so old, it's likely the house might be leaning a little bit, that's okay. Because it's been there for like 50 years, it ain't going anywhere now. A house settles, it's normal construction, but you get what I'm saying. Okay, so avoid houses that are like really like leaning or water. Because this leads to, water is your worst enemy as a real estate investor. You would think it'd be like wiring issues, catching fire and light fixtures blow up and your house catches on fire, that's terrible. <laughs> But water is way worse. The amount of damage water can do is insane. If your toilet leaks on the top floor and it comes all the way down to the basement, it messes up the whole entire house. Water is your worst enemy. So foundation, we don't wanna deal with that crap. Okay, the last thing I'm looking at is windows. What's the quality of the windows? What's the age of the windows? If I'm buying a 1970s house, which in my area, the majority of the houses I'm buying are from the 1970s. My town was, went through a big boom and grew really quick in the 1970s. So are the windows the original 1970s? Okay, that's a lot of years. Okay, we're talking about 50 years or so. These windows are old, so they have to be replaced. Um, cracked windows, single pane glass, that's a big one. Especially up here in the, in the uh, colder climates, single pane windows are no good because you need to think of resale. So while you can rent a house with crappy windows, who cares? Your tenants live in there, they're paying the utilities, kind of crappy to make them do that, but you ultimately don't care because they're paying utilities. However, there will be a day when you go to sell that property and the buyer definitely won't like single pane windows. So just keep that in your mind. How much or what's the quality of the windows? If they are terrible, how much is it gonna cost to replace all the windows? Again, if you're a specialist, like I said, you should already know that number and how much that costs. And are you willing to do that now, right away when you buy the house and change it for the tenants and be a, a nice landlord and provide them good windows? Or are you gonna say, sorry, tenant, business is more important. I will change the windows though when I sell it 10 years later. Okay, so just keep that in mind because windows are very, very expensive. To change windows in a whole single family house like this, typical two story, 1200 square foot house, okay, you're looking at about 30, 40 grand to change all of the windows. Okay, so that's pretty expensive. And if you're down, one thing I found out, if you're down in the southern states like Florida, we just bought properties and we're buying more down there, changing windows in Florida is extremely expensive because they have to be hurricane proof. Again, know your areas. I found that one out the hard way a little bit. 
let's skip the step. Yes, sometimes even successful investors, we skip a little bit of steps, but we find it on the way, no big deal. Okay, so next up, I'm looking for the roof. When I'm done walking through the house, I go outside. What's the quality of the roof? How old are the shingles? How old is the tin roof, the metal roof, the clay tiles, etc.? How old is the roof? And what's the typical lifespan for that roof? And when am I gonna have to replace it? Do I wanna replace it and when? Roofs can be costly as well. A typical single family asphalt shingle roof, yeah, about six to 10 grand, depending on how big the house is. A metal roof, again, ask me how do I know? A metal roof in Florida, um, about 30 to 40K for a metal roof that I just paid. And in Florida, fun fact, if you're buying a house and you want to get insurance on that house, nine times out of 10, the insurance company is going to say, you must change it to a steel roof now. I just bought a house in Florida and the shingle roof was done about three years ago. You can't get insurance for a shingle roof. It just costs so much goddamn money. I'll tell that in a sec. Um, but they said, I want that steel roof on there immediately in the next three months or you don't get insurance. Now be, me being a foreign national investor, my rules were a little different than uh, a resident of the US. But they said, you must change that. I was like, dude, the roof is three years old. They just changed it to shingles. No, no, no. Rip it off and put the steel roof on. And if you don't, the insurance is gonna cost you, I forget what I'm paying, it's something insane. Oh yeah, 6,500 a year. So $6,500 a year. The second I change it to a steel roof, it comes down from 6,500 to uh, 1,500 a year. Okay, so in like three, four years, it paid for the steel roof. Like if I didn't do it, I just kept paying that money. I could have just bought the steel roof in three to four years. So anyway, we put the steel roof on. Again, know your area, know what you're doing. <laughs> okay, so the roof is very, very important. And I did know that before I bought it. I just agreed to do it. It just kind of sucked. Okay, furnace. Uh, next thing we look at is the furnace uh, and the AC. So the other big expense here is the furnace. How old is the furnace? How old is the AC if you're buying down in the States? Lower States, you don't have to wor worry about a furnace generally, but um, how much is that? What's the age? What's the price to change that? Again, you should know that in your head. So these are the top five things to look for when you're going through your property. These are the, the biggest things that cost the most amount of money for yourself. So definitely figure out what these cost. And these are the things that I look for when I'm walking through a house. So once I have all of this in front of me and I have all this knowledge and detail about the house, this kind of base is my offer, right? So based on the comps and the condition of these things, how much can I offer my realtor? What can I tell my realtor to, to offer here? So this is very, very important because if the foundation's crappy, if the windows suck, if the roof is terrible, now I know what to tell my realtor and how to base my offer um, when I present it to the, to the seller. I can base it with comps. So in a neutral market like we're kind of seeing now, there's, there's negotiation going on with sellers, whereas before, there was all cash offers, firm conditions, that's it. So we had, we forgot, we lost the element of negotiation with the sellers. Now we can say, I'm offering you this price based on the comparable sales and based on the fact that your windows suck, I gotta replace them all and the furnace is kinda old so I gotta replace that and the seller kinda goes, yeah, I, I, I guess you're right. So there's that aspect coming back to real estate again which is really great. So this is why you need to know your numbers and present your realtor with your information and the comps to give to the seller when you're making your offer. So that's why it's important to know your numbers and to know the renovations. Next up we have number six and screening your contractors. So I kind of gave a lot of good tips uh, when I was rambling in the last section or so. What I like to do is like I said, we'll start with, uh, I'll just get these out of the way. We got the, we got the referrals, we got Kijiji, and this is where we're spending most, most of our time. Because a lot of you, might be saying, well, Matt, I don't know any investors just yet. I'm just getting started. Or I do know some investors, but I don't want to bother them because you know they're big time. I'm just getting started. They might not talk to me, but they will. But you see what I'm saying. I want you to know how to screen contractors though without just getting referred to it. Or even if you do, you still know what to ask for. So one of the things I like to ask these Kijiji contractors especially is past pictures, that's for sure. I want to see their work. And then what I like to do, obviously for me, it might not be the case for you, but when you buy a house and you have one job going on, I like to bring them through one of my jobs when it's a near completion and show them my style, show them what we do, and then kind of get their facial expressions or their vibe based on what my job says. It's hard to explain over what I'm saying, but when you do it in person, you kind of see it. So when I bring them through, I say, yep, this is what we do. This is what our houses look like. What do you think? What do you think is the worst thing about this house? It's stuff like that. And then asking them questions, I'm kind of quizzing them 
to see what they're thinking or if they say like, oh, this is easy, I can do, I can do this no problem or if they're gonna be like, oh, this is kind of too big for me. Like, I, I'm just one guy, I can't do these type of big houses. So this is why it's very important to kind of bring them through one of your jobs if you don't have that ability because you're not buying houses just yet, I get it, but that's what I like to do. So if you don't have that, very least, uh, past pictures to see kind of what their job is. Now in terms of, of payment, or what, what I should say, in, in that in-person meeting, like I said before, it's really trusting your gut. Like I said, you know, you, you, you have a good sense of vibes when someone's not gonna be right and they're just not giving you good energy. That you know when you meet someone, you're like, that's a bad person or they're lying to you. Trust your gut, please always, like I said, always trust your gut. Whenever I got screwed, I didn't listen to my gut. Now, when it comes to payment, you're probably saying, well, how much do you pay these guys? This is a, a, another thing they're gonna ask you as well, but this is a good screening tool as well. So I pay my contractors $40 an hour. Now, this is a lot, actually, I think. <laughs> Based on industry standards, me being in the industry, I know this is a lot. So I pay $40 an hour, so what this means is I get a better quality person and it kind of screens out the bad people. Because if I'm looking on, on Kijiji and they're offering like, I can do your job for 25 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour, it's not always the truth. Maybe you can get a, a good deal, but it generally means they're a lower level contractor. When I'm offering $40 an hour, I'm automatically going up to, to like the next tier of contractor. And I'm telling them also indirectly that like, hey, I'm a serious real estate investor. I'm a serious business owner and I want to pay a good wage, but you, you have to do good, good work for me as well, right? So and if, any, if any contractor is charging you more, then you know that it might not work or they're just being greedy, which is another bad sign. If they, oh, I'm 60 bucks an hour. It's like, come on, man. Now, again, let me break this down. This is for a carpenter wage. So let me be clear, because anybody watching this video who's an electrician or a plumber, you're probably like, what are you talking about, Matt? <laughs> Electricians, plumbers, and HVAC people generally are way more. We're talking 70, 80 bucks an hour. And that's normal. That's industry standard. It is what it is. You gotta pay them. It sucks. I'm talking about the carpenter's wages, which does about 80% of your renovation. Okay, they're the ones doing the floors, the trim, the doors, the painting, the drywall, the mudding, per perhaps even installing IKEA kitchens or, or kitchens from Home Depot or whatever. What else do they do? Uh, kind of everything. These guys or girls, they do the majority of your work, but they're wages are typically lower because they're doing so many things uh, and it's not a, a specialized thing. Electrician, plumber, HVAC, you must go to school, you must do your apprenticeship, you must be ticketed because you could kill someone. If you're a bad electrician, a bad HVAC person, you could blow the house up, right? So we know that if you're a plumber, you could cause a leak and so you must be specialized. So those trades, they're gonna beat you up. They're gonna charge you a lot. It is what it is. <laughs> I'm talking about the carpenter, okay? So carpenter's 40 bucks an hour. That's the general rate that I charge. And you're probably thinking, Matt, how do you get a good contractor? How do you keep them going? The way I interview people is like I said, and then when I find a good contractor and they do work for me and they're actually good, the biggest thing you can do to keep them working for you is keep them working for you, keep them busy, which means you need to buy more deals. So I know you're thinking, well, I'm just getting started. I'm only buying one or two houses a year. I get it, I, I was there too. What you want to strive to get to the point is you're buying a house every month, every two months to the point where you're keeping that crew busy every single time. So you're buying one house. By the time they're wrapping up this house, you already got another house closing right away. They can just move on to that house and move on to the next house, move on to the next house. So what you're trying to do, what I did is I pretty much had them work for me as employees. Now this worked really great because they were happy because I got a kind of a lower rate. So, if this carpenter would do a normal kitchen renovation for a normal seller, and if you've ever done your kitchen on your own primary house or your own bathroom, you know you're not paying 40 bucks an hour. You got charged 60, 50 bucks an hour or more, right? That's what they do. But for investors, we're savvy, we know business, and I'm gonna keep you busy, so I want to charge 40 bucks an hour. So when you're interviewing them on the interview, that's kind of what you're telling them. It's like, I'm gonna keep you busy, this isn't just, just, just like a one and done house. I'm gonna buy many more and I hope that you can work with me, I can work with you, but you gotta work with me now and I need a slight discount in the exchange of me keeping you busy. And a good contractor will be like, yes, I get it, I get where you're coming from. I'm growing my business, I want steady business to feed my kids, etc. Yes, I will work for you for 40 bucks an hour. That's basically what you're trying to do, right? And the best way you can do that is keep them busy, keep them working for you, 
pretty much keep them as an employee. Um, I, I, and I did this for years, five, six years with two good crews. They worked for me the whole time. Um, fantastic. At a certain point though, when you grow to become an investor like myself and you're buying multiple properties a month, you're flipping five, six, seven houses at once, you need a lot of crews. But at this point, now you're running like a real insane business and you need to lower the margin as much as possible. And even most importantly, is to just have more control over the properties, which is what I really wanted. So one of the kind of negative things with using contractors, even though they were kind of my employees, they weren't my employees. So, for example, I would buy a house and I would say, okay, you're finishing up 123 Main Street, no problem. I just bought another house on 123 Charles Street. It's closing next week. Don't forget, you have to start that house next week. And they're gonna go, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry, but like I gotta start this other basement job I took on, it's just a small job. I'll be there for two weeks and then I'll start your Charles Street job. Or maybe they're working on your house and they're gonna go, okay, I painted it now. I just gotta run over to Susie's house. I gotta paint her bathroom for a couple days and then I'll be back to finish one, two, three Main Street. I promise, I'll be back. Okay, so even though I had a great working relationship with these subcontractors that were pretty much my employees, but they weren't. They had their own business going on. They had their own goals and dreams. I get it, but they didn't have the level of control I want. I want to be able to tell people, hey, you're going over here. I got you to rip out the bathroom um, over there and then hop over to this house while that one's being done with the wiring because you, cause you uh, ripped it out. Now you're gonna go over here and do the flooring at this job, etc. cetera. I, I need you to go here, here, and here, and here. And all I want from you is yes, sir, okay? And the only way you get that is from employees. So at a certain point, when we grew so much and we we're flipping so many properties, I thought it was a better time to switch to having my own true employees. I started a business in a sense, and I, had, I have about four to five guys at any time, and they work directly for me on payroll, on salary kind of thing. And it's absolutely amazing. But this is kind of high level. I'm getting to high level places here in a couple of years probably when you start building your business. Um, but this is, the, this is the trend of where you want to go. Start with you know, a crew, a subcontractor that pretty much works for you and you're keeping them busy because you're actually buying houses, which I'll explain in this video how to grow your business and buy so many houses. Don't worry about that. Um, so we do that for a couple of years. And then when you get really serious, the best thing you can do is start your own business, hire your own employees, for the sole purpose of control, um, and not a creepy way of control, it's just speed. Speed is the most important thing when it comes to real estate investing and flipping, especially flipping, is speed. So I can't have you going over to this job and painting Lucy's basement. I need you at this house to get it done because I gotta get it on the market and sell it ASAP because I just bought three more houses and I need you over there. So I need these jobs done quick. So the only way you can do that and reliably is with the employee. So that's my thing right there. One thing I forgot to jump over, looking at my notes here, this is why I have them. <laughs> with the contractors, when you're dealing with subcontractors, how I pay them is, I'm jumping around, but I hope you get what I'm saying here. Labor only, how can I forget this? It was so important. Okay, so when I'm working with the, con the subcontractors, not the employees, the subcontractors, when I get them to quote on my jobs, when I do meet them and I say, I, my gut feeling is good about them, I've seen their past job, maybe it was a past referral from a friend of mine who's an investor, no, whatever it is, and I've chosen this contractor, and now I've purchased the house and I want them to quote on it, I tell them I only want a labor only quote. I don't want materials in there. Why? I can buy materials. And, th and this is what I did and still do to this day while I was building my, my business. I buy the materials, the flooring, the drywall, the two by fours, whatever. I order it, I get it delivered to the house, and I pay for it. Now the contractor will tell me, Matt, we need, like I'm not in there counting, okay, we need 30 sheets of drywall, I need 66 two by fours, no, 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 no. They're telling me what they need, but I'm ordering it. I'm ordering the tiles, I'm ordering the taps, the sink, the countertops, whatever. I'm ordering it and I'm paying for it. All I want from you, Mr. Contractor, is the labor quote. How long will it take you to do this, this house? Is it 30 days with two guys? Okay, well, and this is why I do this. If they tell me it's gonna take me 30 days and I need three guys, perfect. Well, we know your rate is $40 an hour, okay? So you're gonna go $40 an hour times 40 hours a week. It's gonna take you four weeks, you're saying, and you need four guys. I don't know what that number is, but you see what I'm saying? 
So let's just pretend, because I'm not a friggin' mathematician. <laughs> let's just say this number came to $15,000 to do this job in labor. But the quote they gave you was 23,000. Then the more savvy you get, and I've caught so many contractors doing it because I'm in the business, I, I was a contractor, I'm a savvy real estate investor, I've been doing this for many, many years. So I know, even, even before the contractor comes in, I know what the price is. I'm not a moron. I know generally what the price is, very close. Cause I know, I, I've done this. This house should take a crew of three guys a month. If they're here every day, nine to five, 40 hours a week, it should take these guys a month. So I do the math in my head. I do the three, you know, 40 hours a week times four weeks times three guys. I already know the number. And I ask them, you come through, you tell me your number. And they're gonna tell me the number and I'm gonna go, mm -mm -mm. I did the math. And then when I tell them my math, just like I did this, and I go, what do you think? Does that, is, does that sound right? It's easier to catch them in a lie or catch them trying to take advantage of you when you know the numbers. And the reason why I do labor only is because it's easier. Because if they do a material and labor quote, just a general all in quote, it's easier for them to fudge the numbers for them, for the benefit of them. Because they're doing this calculation, trust me, being a contractor, they're doing this same calculation. Okay, I'm gonna be here for 30 days, I'm gonna need three guys, 40 hours a week. Okay, I know my cost is this. I, and then I'll price the materials and the materials are gonna be whatever, 27,000 bucks. Uh, I'll just top that up to uh, 35,000 bucks. Yeah, I'll top that, th 35 grand for the materials. Well, you just topped me up seven grand. So that's how it's easier to screw you when they quote on everything. So that's why I only quote, give me a quote, labor only. Material is material. If you buy it or I buy it, material is the same cost. I'll buy the material, you give me a labor only quote. Okay, so that's what, how we do that. And then when it comes to payment, when they start the job, because I'm paying labor only and I'm buying the materials, I'm not paying you up front. You're gonna work for me for two weeks or so, just like any other job, and I'll pay you once you get to a certain point. So, because contractors always want money up front, right? And they should. But why do they want money up front? Mostly for materials. So they can order the materials, order the decking material, the drywall. They want money for that. And then they get paid on their labor only. But remember, you're paying the materials. You're buying the materials. So why are you giving them money up front? No more money up front. So the odds of you getting screwed by contractor, almost minimal. So they get zero money up front. When they get to 25% completion, I give them 25% of the quote. Let's just say the quote for the, the labor was 15,000. I'm gonna give them 25% of 15,000. When they get to 50% down the job, half of the job, I'll give them the other 25%. 75%, you get where I'm going with this, and when the job's done, and only when it's done, do you get the last 25%. You see what I'm saying? So with this formula, it's almost impossible for them to take advantage of you, especially if the quote is based on labor only. So that's kind of the secret um, to hiring a good contractor. That was a very, very important part of the video, so I wanna spend a lot of time on it. Next up, we got the fun stuff now. Number seven, how to analyze a single family home. Now, because most of you are gonna be buying single family properties, that's what like 90% of real estate investors start off, we're gonna start with that. And I'm gonna go through each niche, I believe, yes. I'm gonna go through each one very quickly, but we'll spend the most time on, on the single family. So how do I analyze a single family property? Um, like I said, you need to know your numbers up front, you need to know how much the property is gonna renovate for, all that stuff. But let's just say, we're gonna buy this house in Miami for 350. It's a piece of crap bungalow, let's just say for example, because it would have to be for this price. So I'm gonna take that 350, and this is, this is what I do still to this day. When I send out properties to my clients, even being a savvy real estate investing focused realtor, I send these breakdowns and these, uh, how I analyze them is on just basics, like a Word document. Like I don't have anything fancy and that's the point I'm trying to tell you. You don't need some crazy Excel sheet because when, you, when you're using Excel or some crazy formula, fancy stuff, it's easier to fudge the numbers. Okay, it's easier to say, oh, the rent is this much. I'm just gonna top it up a little bit just so the spreadsheet looks a little better. It's easier to fudge stuff. We don't wanna fudge stuff. We want actual real numbers um, because you don't wanna make a mistake. You don't wanna just fudge the numbers on a spreadsheet in theory, and you buy the property and it doesn't work out to be the theory like it said on the paper, which happens all too often. So I like to do it old school, man. Boring, old school. So we start with the mortgage payment. Now let's say the $350,000 house, the mortgage payment is $1,418. 
and 72 cents. Okay, so this is based on a 4.5 interest rate, 20% down over 30 years. Um, so that, that's a very typical mortgage rate you're gonna find anywhere right now in Canada and America. So for this $350,000 house, mortgage payment every month is $1,418.72. Next up, we got taxes, property taxes. Uh, for that, we got 220. It's a typical property tax for my area. Insurance on that, for this is a rental property, right? Long-term rental. 100 bucks a month for the property insurance. Uh, property manager. Now, my property manager charges me 5% every single month, so it happens to be $100. So you're probably thinking, Matt, 5% of the, of the rent. This is a great deal, and the more deals you buy, um, the better quality of rates you'll get. And my property manager is awesome. 5% is kind of the low end of the industry standard. Typically, it's 8%, but mine's 5% because I give a lot of deals, and I have a lot of something I'm gonna tell you about later coming up in this video of why you wanna do what I do and specialize because you get rewarded when you're a little, starts with an F. Famous, kind of. Okay, we'll both I'm joking, but you'll see why it's soon. Okay, so the expenses, probably the most narcissistic thing I said ever on this channel, but it's a joke. Okay, so <laughs> your expenses every month are $1,838.72. The rent on this property for my area, we're pretending it's Miami, but I'm using my numbers for my area. The rent is 2,000 a month, which yeah, I guess a Miami house would rent for 2,000 bucks easily. So the cash flow, which is the most important thing, the cash flow is $161.28. Now, I know a lot of you nerds, sweet real estate nerds are going, Matt, you forgot maintenance and vacancy in your calculation here. Well, here's the thing. With single family properties, I know you tried to get me, but you didn't get me. I didn't include those because with single family property, we're not getting rich and retiring off $161 a month net cash flow. Remember, single family real estate investing is not a retirement strategy tomorrow. It's a long-term strategy. So you're not relying on this income to live your life. I hope you're doing something else in your life. You have another business, you're working your full-time job and you're okay with that, etc. Single family is long, boring, but it's a strategy the majority of people use when investing in real estate. So what I do is all of this money goes into my bank account, like the property bank account. And by the way, every property you buy has its own bank account. So if you look at my bank, which I'm not gonna show you obviously, but if you did log into my bank, I got accounts like crazy and they're all named 123 Main Street, 123 John Street, 123 whatever, all these accounts. So whatever property I have allocated, all the cash flow goes into here for the purpose of maintenance and vacancy, just creating that reserve fund, stacking it. And then when I sell the property three, five, 10 years later, I just take all the money, cash flow that I've saved up, the proceeds from the sale of the property, et cetera. So single family, that's how I really tell all my clients. That's what I tell you to do. Just bank all of the money, all of it. So instead of doing 5% maintenance, 5% vacancy, which would bring this number down to like, I don't know, $10 a month. And that's what you get to keep for yourself. Just put all of it in the bank account for single family real estate investing. So that's how um, uh, you analyze a single family property. I'll leave it here for a second, but that's it. And this is why I love single family. It's so easy. The numbers are so simple. It's basic. Buy a crappy house in a good area with good GDP growth, job growth, population growth, et cetera. You already know that. Renovate it better than everybody else. Put in a good quality tenant. Here are the expenses you have. Here's the cash flow. Put it all in the bank account. Let's buy the next one. It's very, very simple, okay? So that's how we analyze a single family property. Uh, we're not gonna analyze actually a multifamily property because I know I told you I was, but it's way too in depth because like I said, it's way more business savvy. I do have a video, like I said earlier, about multifamily. Check that video in, in the uh, description. I don't want this video to be like six hours. It's probably gonna be like two or three hours, that's long enough. If I did this, the, the multifamily breakdown, it would be like another friggin' hour, literally. And I have another hour video that I've already done in the description, solely breaking down multifamily properties. So check that out instead, and we can keep rocking here on the other stuff. So, but this is how we, we would analyze uh, an Airbnb, a student property, and a single family property. So there's no difference, really. Just with the Airbnb, we're adding a few more costs. Um, the, well, the property manager will be way more for sure. So there's a few different costs and there'll be more maintenance, but the cash flow is way higher. And the strategy will be, will be kind of the same with the Airbnb. We're just stacking all the money in the account because it's a business now, 
and we're just filling up the business account. So this is how we analyze a single family property. Very, very basic. And uh, so we go to the property, like I said, you check out the basement, the foundation, the windows, the roof, you put the renovation budget in, you come back home, you do the actual numbers on the actual property price. When you decide, I've seen the house, I've seen the foundation, I'm gonna offer this price based on that. I run my numbers, I got positive cash flow. fantastic. I call my realtor, hey, put the offer in on Main Street. I did my numbers, the cash flow as well, and then we put the offer in. So that's kind of how that works in a nutshell. So number eight, what do we got here? Property setup at closing. So now we put the offer in, right? The numbers made sense. You called your realtor, you put the offer in, fantastic. Now we gotta set up the property um, before we close because we want things in motion even before we close so we're not stressed out right on closing day because we have a billion things to worry about after that. Let's get these out of the way now. So what you wanna do is you put the offer in, it's accepted, it closes. 30 days from now, 45 days from now, fantastic. Now we move on to this step. We set up our insurance. So we call our insurance person. We say, hey, I just bought you know, a single family house in Miami. It's, it's on this street. They're gonna send you the quote back, et cetera, et cetera. You're gonna accept it, fantastic. You got your insurance set up for closing day, which is 30 days from now, done. We don't have to worry about that no more, check mark. Okay, then we call the utilities. You gotta set up your gas, electricity in Canada, we call it hydro. I get nailed on that all the time on my YouTube channel. I call it hydro and all the Americans go, what the hell is hydro? Electricity, okay. So we set up our electricity, our gas, our water. We set up all the utilities for closing day, 30 days from now, because we're gonna renovate it, right? We'll be holding onto it for a month, two months, three months, however big the renovation is. So we gotta set up those utilities. And then obviously when we have it for rent, we take our till, we shut off our utilities and the tenant puts them on, ideally, we, our property is set up that way. But for the purpose of closing our property, we call the utilities, we got that set up, fantastic. Next thing up, we get the contractor quotes. Yes, I know, we don't wait for closing, that's, that's terrible. The house closes 30, 40, 60 days from now, as soon as I get the offer accepted, I'm doing all these things, by the way, in like one day. So now I'm calling my contractor. Hey, I just bought a property. It's closing in 30, 40 days. Can you come quote on it ASAP? I set up a viewing with my realtor or with the wholesaler or whoever I bought it through. And I want to get in there ASAP and bring them through. Maybe two contract, maybe three contractors. If you're still not, if you're still trying to find the right contractor, you haven't found the right one yet to work for you on your team, you bring a few in and you get them all the quote the same way. Remember labor only, uh, I order all the materials, et cetera, et cetera. So you get them to quote that way. And then you get your quotes two, three, four days later. You pick the one you wanna work with, fantastic. And you schedule them to start 30, 40 days from now. So that, that's why we do all this before closing because I want them to start on day one. I close August 1st, let's say. They're renovating August 2nd. That's the best way to do it. And that's how savvy investors do it. You don't wanna wait until a week before closing because then they're gonna say, well, I'm busy, I gotta do John's basement, then I gotta do Lucy's bathroom, I don't know, I might be there August 30th. So we've been holding it for a month, paying, holding costs, financing costs, no man. Speed, remember, real estate investing is all about speed. The faster you go, the faster you can grow, the faster you can retire and live the life you wanna live. So we wanna go through these quick. So we get the contractor book ahead of time, ideally they start right after closing. Okay, so once the contractor is picked, they're scheduled, Check mark, everything's good to go. Now, we order materials. Now, remember, I'm closing theoretically on August 1st, right? Right now is June 20th, let's just say. I'm ordering materials now on June 20th. I'm ordering the flooring, the baseboards, the doors, whatever he wants. I'm getting it all set up, the windows especially, because those take time. I'm getting that contractor in to order those. The roof, I'm getting that schedule, et cetera. I'm ordering the taps, the sinks. This is what we do. I order everything. And by the way, if you guys are overwhelmed by this renovation process, like, oh my God, Matt's ordering all of his materials already. Like, how is this, how is this gonna happen? I have a course down below where you can just do my entire renovation course. So I offer you all of the materials that you see in my renovations the flooring, the baseboards, what doors do I use? What taps do I use? What light fixtures? What hood vent do I use for the kitchen? What countertops do I use? What kitchen cabinets do I use? What's, I don't know, what paint colors do I use? You get all of that 
in my course below. So you're not overwhelmed and going, well, how am I gonna create this system? Matt knows how to renovate everything. I can't do that overnight. It took him 12 years. Don't worry about it. Get the course below and just copy my entire renovation. Just steal it. <laughs> and your houses will look exactly like mine. Super easy and you're good to go. So you can start ordering all that stuff ahead of time. Because if you're ordering it from Amazon, Wayfair, I kind of gave it away, but that's where we order most of our stuff. I, I order from there. It takes, whatever, a week to get to my house. So I'm ordering all these things that gets to my house. I'm putting them in the garage so that on August 2nd, when my contractor starts, I close August 1st. They're starting August 2nd. Boom, he's already got the flooring, the baseboards, the doors, they're all in the garage. The tile's there, everything's there. That's how we build a business and that's how we scale quickly because it's just a system. We're specializing, we know exactly what the houses cost, we know what they're gonna rent for, we know how we're gonna renovate them based on our, what our tenant profile wants. We order everything, it's a system. All my houses look the exact same with minor tweaks, more so on the flips because the flips are more extravagant. We tweak a little bit of thing. If we're, if we're downtown, we're doing a little more downtown-y style renovation. If it's in the suburbs, I'm doing a little more suburby renovation. But the base formula is there. But the rental properties, they all look the exact same. Bing, 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 same everything. Same everything, over and over and over again. That's how we do the system. So we're doing that. Um, and then what we do, last but not least, is we take before pictures. So maybe on closing day, right before they start, so on August 1st it closes, they start the next day, I might go then to take the pictures or on my first walkthrough with the uh, contractor before we close, I'm, I might just take pictures. In my case, we do a video always because video marketing is amazing. I'll get to that in a sec. Um, so on closing day, I'll definitely go with my social media, get media person. We'll shoot all the pictures, all the videos we wanna do before so that when it's done, I can do it again. And I'll tell you what to do with all that stuff very, very soon. So these are the things you have to do uh, before you close. So very, very strategic, very, very intentional to get the job going fast so that on closing day, we don't have to worry about all these things. They're already done and now we can get onto the good stuff. Number nine, the reno. <laughs> so now we're talking more about specialization here. So who is your tenant or your buyer? Faster, faster so they don't get bored. <laughs> Terrible writing, okay. Who is your tenant and who is your specific buyer? So this is what I was saying by when we do our flips, we do a little bit of tweaking because downtown is a certain style, suburbs is a certain style, but when it comes to your rental properties and your entire style, your entire portfolio, because remember, you're specializing in one area, in one town with one specific type of property, so you must have a specific type of tenant. Who are they? So that you can gear your renovation and everything, your entire style, based on that. So, is your ideal tenant younger slash uh, millennial Gen Z. So I am a, I'm a millennial. Gen Z is like, I would say, what, when, when were they born? 1998. So they're like 20 years old, 22, 23, 24 years old kind of thing. So is your ideal tenant younger or a millennial Gen Z? So if they are, if this is your ideal type of uh, clientele, they tend to be multi-family buildings because the rent is lower, uh, you know, they're just starting off their career, especially if they're Gen Z, they're just starting their career, they don't have a ton of money, it's not like they're gonna rent, um, you know, the whole detached house by themselves. What we got here? Uh, this, they also tend to live more downtown. So we know people that live more downtown, you know, the style's more trendy, a little more urban, cold, more grays, uh, more modern, so this is a huge influence. You don't wanna do a downtown urban style on like a country property or like in the suburbs. You can, but that's not the ideal tenant. Remember, we're taking this business very, very seriously. We're not just any other real estate investor who just slaps a gray paint on a wall and does whatever. We're doing that. But then we're adding key little specializations to attract the specific clientele. Again, this is high level. We're thinking like a marketer. As I always say, and I'll get into very much and very soon, is you're not necessarily a real estate investor. What you really are is a marketer first who happens to do real estate investing. So who are you marketing to? 
who is this unit going to be marketing to? So these, these younger tenants tend to be more modern, like I said, and more urban. So if this is your ideal clientele or your ideal tenant or your ideal buyer, if you're flipping real estate, this is where they hang out. Tend to be multifamily buildings, not always, but mostly, but they most likely live downtown. They want and expect more modern urban styles. So is that who you want? Now the straight millennial, which is me, I'm kind of in the middle millennial. I was born in 88. I think it, millennial is 1982 to 1997. I think it is the, the millennial. So I'm right in the middle. I'm the middle millennial, give or take. So millennials like me, they tend to want single family properties. Why? I'm 33 years old. You know, we just had a baby. So we're starting our family. We're in that family kind of thing. So we're single family. We're more, we have kids. We got a dog, which I do have a dog, <laughs> right? So we want those kind of, so we're more likely to live in the suburbs. Why? We want quiet. I don't want to be with the streets. I'm an old man. Get off my lawn. I'm becoming that dude in the next 10 years. Right, so we, we're getting into the suburbs now. So what's the style of a person that wants to be in the suburbs? Clean, still modern, but maybe more, it's hard to say depending on what state you're on. If, if you're investing in single family properties in Tennessee, this is gonna look a hell of a lot different than the properties investing in uh, Massachusetts or New York state, right? Same suburban style, but totally different state. Obviously people living in Tennessee are gonna want more ranchy, country feeling, uh, more country color, a country kitchen right? Shaker panel kitchen, whereas we're doing sh uh, modern shaker. That was kind of confusing, but you know, I'm talking about the panels on the door, more farm style. Whereas where I'm doing it in Canada, we don't want farm style. We're, we're not Tennessee, right? Or Alabama or Louisiana. We're, we're not that, right? So it depends where you're buying and the age group you're hitting at will kind of dictate what rental style you want to do. So like I said, you want to, so depending on what style you're going to do, and these are the most popular tenants right now. Um, because boomers probably, oh, we'll put boomers here, but um, well, I guess they could be a good clientele to hit, but they're, they're in retirement homes. That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> but they likely own their own home at this point. Boomers are what? 60 years old and plus, 55 and plus. So not likely to be tenants. So we're not gonna spend too much time on them on, on this video. Your tenants are most likely gonna be, and your buyers for flips, are most likely gonna be uh, millennials, either young, middle, or old millennials, or Gen Z's, which are really young. Right now, at the time I film this video, Gen Z's are young, and they want a specific style, that is for sure. And they want internet, and they want Google Homes to talk to. I'm kidding, okay, so it depends what your tenant profile is. And then again, we're ordering all of the materials based on this profile. We're ordering all of them beforehand so that everything is done, everything's ready to go. So on closing day, our contractor starts. Like I said, we're thinking like a marketer first. What does our ideal, renter or buyer wants, that dictates how we renovate. We don't renovate and then hope the millennial comes or hope the Gen Z comes if we're buying multifamily buildings because you're most likely gonna get a Gen Z tenant, by the way. So if you don't like Gen Zs, don't be buying multifamily buildings because that's most likely your tenant profile. But that dictates what we're doing, what we're buying and how we're renovating. So keep that in mind. Okay, so that's the renovation portion. Now we know who our tenant profile is, how we're gonna renovate, how we're gonna order all the materials ahead of time. Number 10, now we're getting to the meat and potatoes of this video. The most important thing on how to actually grow your business and that is joint venture attraction. Key note here, attraction. Now, the old way of getting joint venture partners, which is what we're not doing at all, is meet people, shake their hand, do a presentation, give them a performa, that's not gonna work anymore. If you wanna raise money and get joint venture partners, which I highly recommend, it is the only way to grow your business and actually kill it, is to get money partners. I know it might sound like you're like, Matt, I don't wanna do it. Okay, let's back, let's go back up. Funny story. When I was starting off, I absolutely did not wanna do joint venture attraction. I thought I could do it all on my own. I'm a very lone wolf mentality. I'm very hardworking. I know I can get shit done. I don't know about anybody else, but I know I can get shit done. That was my mentality. I'll just do it myself. So I went to all these networking events, all these real estate investing seminars, and I always saw the damn person on a stage always say the importance of getting joint venture partners. You gotta get a joint venture partner. And every time I would just check out, I'd, be, I'd leave the room like, I don't wanna listen to this. I'll come back when they're done talking about this bullshit, joint venture partnership. <laughs> so I was 22 years old. When I got to a certain point, I think around 25, 26 years old, 
when I hit that financing wall, which was for me, two properties. Remember how I said it was like normally four or five, six properties? Well, I was 23 years old, 24 years old. I used up all my money, all my credit. I wasn't making that much money. I was a carpenter employee at that time, making 30K a year, I think it was. So the banks didn't love me that much. So I bought my two properties, which was amazing for that time, actually, like that was amazing. I bought two properties, even with that income, way, way different time. Um, but that was it. So I hit my wall and I was like, dude, I want to keep being a real estate investor. I want to be like these people I'm meeting at these events who have like 30, 40, 80 properties. I, I want to be like them, but I can't. I don't, have, I don't have any more money. And for me to save the next 20% down, making 30K a year, and the 20% down on my typical properties in my area is like, I need like 150K. You know how long it's gonna take me to save 150 grand when I make 30 grand a year and I only get take home after tax 24,000? It's gonna take me like 20 years. Too slow. So I finally said, oh, maybe everybody that was talking about these joint venture things, maybe they were right. Maybe they were onto something. I'm gonna check it out. So I hired a marketing coach because I was also a real estate agent, remember, at, at this time. I just got my real estate license about 23, 24 years old. Um, so I hired a marketing coach to help me build my realtor business, which remember, I was specializing only with investors. But what ended up happening is with the realtor marketing, I attracted just as much or more partners. People saw what I was doing, which I'm gonna break down right now. And they said, Matt, you know what you're doing with this realtor thing. Instead of just being your realtor client, why don't I just partner with you? You know, I have money, but I'm busy with kids and my family. I don't have time to even be your client. How about you just do it all? Here's the money, let's do it together. And I was like, damn. And I was getting partners, partners, partners. And I thought, I was like, wait a second. This realtor marketing, I hired a marketing coach who knew his stuff with marketing, that's for damn sure. He was teaching me these tricks. I was like, this is working for joint venture attraction. And I just went all in with that marketing and I just attract so much money. And to this point of this day, I've raised over, way over, it's gotta be now, way over $50 million, all from what I'm gonna tell you right now. So first things first, before we can even do that, we're thinking like a savvy business owner. Who is your ideal partner? Remember how we did the ideal tenant? Who's our ideal tenant profile, which will invariably tell us which real estate niche we need to focus on. For example, if, we're, if we want a Gen Z tenant because they leave often, they can raise the rents more, therefore, we must most likely specialize with multifamily properties. And because we specialize with multifamily properties, we will most likely renovate it this certain way. See how the chain reaction goes down on who your clientele is. Well now, with joint venture, who is our ideal partner? So this kind of dictates about everything. So what I would say to do, what I did, my marketing coach told me to do this with my real estate agent business. He said, Matt, write an essay about your ideal realtor client, your ideal investor client. Well, in this case, when it works so well with the realtor business, I thought, man, I'm gonna do this again with the partnership business. Write an essay on who they are. So get real creepy. So. I shared this in my, by, by, by the way, I have another course. <laughs> Cause again, I can't spend six hours on this one topic, but I wish I could. But I have a course below in the description called Unlimited Cash. And I do spend over six hours busting this down where I'm gonna bust for you now for the next, I don't know, half an hour. I bust it down for six hours teaching you how to attract your investor partners. And in that course, I give you the essay that I wrote for my ideal joint venture partner. So you can kind of model it and kind of see how it is but I'll go over it real quick in this video. So my ideal partner, and this is, this is what I did. I'm not lying to you guys. This is exactly what I did. I was like 24 years old. I was like, my marketing coach, Joey, told me to do this. His name was Joey. Um, Joey told me to do this. I'm gonna do it. So I wrote, so my ideal joint venture partner, his name is Paul. It still is to this day. All my partners mostly are Pauls, okay? So Paul is between 40 and 45, very specific. It's a 40, 45% husband, he works an IT based job typically. It's like an office computer IT job. Uh, he's very busy, high stress. And right now we're making like a mind map, we're masterminding right now. So he's high stress. He's got three kids. Um, his wife, he loves his wife dearly, but he barely has any time with her. Okay, now we're getting to the good stuff. And this is what I'm saying. This is the detail I want you to get to. He doesn't spend any time with his wife. Why? 
He works nine in the morning. He has to rush to drop the kids off to school. So he rounds the kids up after breakfast. So he wakes up at like 6.37. They eat breakfast together real quick. Everybody's rushing. The morning is fucking chaotic. This is, this is what I want. I'm focusing very creepily on who they are. And I'll tell you why in a second. So he's rushing in the morning. He puts the kids in the car to work at 8.30. He's rushing to go to drop them off to school for 8.45. See ya kids, drops them off. Then he rushes to work to get there for 9 a.m. He's sitting in traffic. He's pissed off. He's stressed out. He gets to work. Doesn't really like it too much. He makes a good income, by the way. He makes between 110 and 130K a year. Makes a good income. He's happy about that. But his damn job is just so stressful. So he gets there. He works from nine to five. Job's boring. At five o'clock, he's, he's rushing to pick them up from daycare slash school because they've been there since three. School's out at three. So he's rushing them at school. He wants to get them ASAP because they're pissed off sitting there at school all, for two more hours after school. That's lame, dad. So he's got to rush there, pick them up. They rush home. They get home at like 5.30, 5.40. They eat really, 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 really quick. Dinner time is a, is a gong show, just like breakfast time was. Then they rush off by 6.30. They got to bring the one daughter to like ballet and the mom will go with the daughter to ballet. Dad will drive the next kid to soccer for 6.30. They do soccer time. They do ballet time. They reconvene back at home at like 8.39. They put the kids to bed really quick at like 9. And from 9 p.m. to like 10.30 p.m. is husband and wife time. If they even make the 10.30 p.m. because they're so goddamn tired from the day. That's how specific I know who Paul is. So why do I care about this? Because when Paul sees me marketing and says, which I'll get to, we're in it. Let's just get to it. Well, in my marketing, which I'll get to now in my videos, my, my social media, I'm talk, when I'm talking about my real estate deals, hey, if you invest with me in Kitchener, in KW, I provide a stress free because I do all the work. I do everything. If you're looking to travel more, oh, by the way, and Paul also only gets two weeks off a year for vacation with him, his wife, his kids, and they love going to like Cuba or Mexico to the resorts, but they only get two weeks a year and he would love to have way more. So when Paul sees me saying, I can give you more uh, stress-free time, you know, we can build cash flow. So hopefully in the next five years, you can kind of retire or get close to retirement, depending on how many properties you buy with me. And also, Paul watches me on Instagram and social media and YouTube, and he knows that I travel a lot. My real estate business allows me to travel a lot. Paul loves traveling, loves it, but he can't travel only two weeks a year. So he sees me traveling to Bali, Iceland, Hawaii all the time, Costa Rica, all the places we've been to before, before the, the C word. We travel all the time, and now we're getting back to traveling again for this purpose of not only enjoying traveling, but the business I get from traveling, incredible. So Paul sees me traveling all the time, living this stress-free life. I'm now, I just now had a baby. I, I, I get to spend all my time with my baby. The business runs itself. I spend all of my time other than doing these videos. I'm hanging out with my family upstairs and we're just having a great time. So Paul sees all this stuff and I'll break this all down soon. Don't worry, I'm bringing more detail. He says, how the fuck is Matt doing all this? How is he traveling all the time? How is his real estate business allowing him to quit his other crap job and just live the entrepreneur life and he promises, you know, stress-free real estate investing. I see he does single family because it's stress-free. I like stress-free. My work is so stressful. I want more st stress-free stuff. Matt has that. You know what? And I, and I love real estate investing. I'm just going to partner with Matt. Matt knows what he's doing. He's got the videos. He's got everything. He's got the team set up. Why would I even try to do all this stuff? Matt already has it all. I'm just going to partner with Matt. Paul calls me says, hey, I saw you on YouTube, or he emails me, I saw you on YouTube, or he DMs me on Instagram. This happens all the time. I'm not making this up. This is exactly how this happens. I get DMs, calls, emails all the time. Hey, I saw you on YouTube. I see what you're doing. Man, you're killing it. I trust you. Do you have any more room for partners? That's exactly what happens. People are literally throwing money at me all the time, and they're going to do that for you as well. I'm going to break it down on how we do that, but I only can do this if I wrote the essay. I know exactly who Paul is, and the biggest important thing is I know his pains and I know his gains. These are marketing terms. His pain is he only gets an hour if he's lucky with his wife every night before he falls asleep. So their relationship isn't very good. They're not, connect, they're not connected anymore. They just, they barely see each other. So you see how creepy I'm getting. Dude, if you want to be successful in business and real estate, you got to be a creep like the fruitful investor. Okay. I'm getting deep with the marketing. I know his pain is he would love to spend more time with his kids and not have to rush to school anymore. 
So instead of working till five, if he were to invest in real estate with me and make some more income, maybe he could only work until three instead of working till five. He tells his boss, hey, I don't need the extra hours. I'm gonna stop work every day at three so I can pick my kids up at three instead of five and spend two hours of quality time with the kids before they go to ballet. See what I'm saying? So that's, those are the key things, by the way, I'm saying in my videos and in my marketing, which we're gonna get to. But I, like I said, if you wanna get more detail on how to do this in a plug and play kind of system, check the link below, Unlimited Cash, the course. I give you everything, six hours, I give you the templates, everything. Easy, easy peasy. So write the essay on who your ideal joint venture partner is, which will kind of set everything up for what we're talking about here. Like I said, know their pains and gains. And the biggest thing is, in the marketing, which we're gonna to get to, we wanna talk about the benefits over, <laughs> I can't think and speak and write at the same time. It doesn't work. The benefits over the feature. So what that means is, <clears throat> what a lot of real estate investors do is they just talk about the, like the features of the property. Like it cash flows this much. The, the ROI will be 10% or 12% or whatever. The cash flow will be this. The cash on cash return will be 3%. Okay, I've done all that. We all have. How many times, if you're a real estate investor, have you found a deal, went to a family member or a friend or a partner and said, hey, I found this great deal downtown. The cash on cash return is 3%. Can you believe the property cash flows 400 bucks a month? It's crazy. This is a great deal. And the person you pitched that deal to kind of went, nah, I don't know. Not really interested in it. Maybe the next deal. And they make up some lame excuse. I'm just, I'm just kind of busy right now, which basically means I'm not interested but the deal makes perfect sense. It cash on cash is this. The cash flow is 400 bucks a month. What do you mean you're not interested? You told me you want to invest in real estate. I found you the best deal. It cash flow is this. I'm not interested. I'm busy right now. Why? They don't trust you. They don't care about the numbers. This is the thing. Nobody cares about cash flow. Nobody cares about cash on cash return. Nobody cares about ROI. I can go right now on the computer and find tons of deals that cash flow positive. That have a great ROI percentage. I have this and I have that. And if I just talk about that and I blast it on social media, I'll probably get no partners. They'll just be like, okay, but it makes sense. The numbers all make sense. Why aren't I getting partners? They don't care. I'm telling you, human beings care about emotions and pains and gains. And you saying 12%, 30%, 36%, it doesn't, doesn't compute in their brain. But when you say, if you invest with me in this property, it's gonna allow you to spend more time with your kids. It's gonna allow you to take more vacations because this property is gonna kill it over the next couple of years. We're gonna sell in five years and each make 100, 100 grand. You can work less at your job after that and go on way more vacations. Now I'm speaking Paul's language. Now I'm smoking the pains and I'm showing the gains. I'm talking about the benefits of partnering with me over the features of partnering with me, which is 12% this, 30% that, nobody cares. They care about emotions. You always, always wanna target the emotions. So, how do we target the emotions? Online marketing is everything. So like I said, the old world would be going to a networking meeting, shaking hands, hey, I found this deal downtown, it's got 12% cash on cash return, blah, 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 all the crap that we've done ever since the 1990s and before that, all the cheesy salesman shit. The, if you watch all the salesman videos or whatever, you know all the tricks, copying, mirroring what they do. If they have their hands in their pockets, you have your hands in your pockets. You know, you're talking like this rather than straight on. All the fucking stupid things that we've heard about the 1990 car salesman bullshit, it doesn't work anymore. People are getting more and more introverted and they want, when you pitch someone like that and you're, and you're not even pitching, you're just talking about a deal, but nowadays it comes off as pitching, and as soon as someone pitches, we know automatically to turn away. We know we're programmed now in 2022 to not be sold to. We don't wanna be sold to. So online marketing is amazing because we get to sell people indirectly, by the way, I'll get into that, in the comfort of their own home. So they don't even know they're being sold. <laughs> That's the difference. When you're at a networking meeting and you're talking to people and you're doing all this shit and you're talking and your hands in your pockets and you're doing all the salesman tricks, they know you're trying to sell them something and they shut down immediately. But when they're at home in their comfy pajamas after a hard day at work, eating some pizza, and they're watching you on YouTube, and you're talking about your real estate business and your game, you're selling them directly, or indirectly, sorry, and they don't even know they're being sold to because they're comfy. They're in their home, they don't feel like they're being attacked, 
but you're going right in, baby. You're going right into their psyche and right into their stuff. So again, we're getting creepy here. Okay, so online marketing is absolutely amazing. Like I said, I've raised over $50 million, all from YouTube. This video I'm doing right here, I guarantee is gonna get me partners. I absolutely guarantee it. Why? I'm providing free content. I'm, I'm gaining authority and trust because I know what I'm talking about and I have track record to prove it. I got all the before and after videos. They know if, they, if you follow me on, on YouTube here and you have been for a while, you probably trust me to the point that you at least can say, Matt knows what he's talking about. I've seen his videos. I've seen his before and afters. That dude knows what he's talking about. And doing these type of videos is what really uh, gains that trust. So I'll get into that soon too, but I'm gonna go over the entire online marketing strategy on how to really kill it and how to actually attract joint venture partners in 2022. This is now the 2022 guide to attract joint venture partners. Okay, so first up, we do the blogs. And what do we talk about in the blogs? I want you to write 10 blogs. And you're probably like, Matt, this is boring. I don't want to talk. I don't want to. This is everything. Forget everything else. Oh, if I just find the, the right deal, the partner will come. Terrible advice. That's what all the 1990 real estate investors do. Find the good deal first and the partners will come. Like I said in the example, how many deals have we found, great deals, where we showed somebody the numbers and they said, no, not interested. Well, why not? The numbers are right there. Don't find the deal first. This is 2022 now, totally different. We find the partner first, we lock them in in the back pocket, and then we find the deal and we just sell them the deal from the back pocket. That's what I do. Okay, so how do we do that? Number one, we write 10 blogs. Write blogs about what? Matt, what are you talking about? Well, what do I even write about? What you specialize in. So if you're doing single family properties in Miami, we're sticking with that example here, you're gonna write 10 blogs about single family investing in Miami and how amazing it is. So some simple topics would be five reasons why single family properties in Miami are amazing. Five ways to retire with single family properties in Miami. Five top neighborhoods in Miami for single family investing. You see what I'm getting at? You're writing blogs about what you specialize in and where so that when people search up on Google, because everybody's on Google, everybody's looking for information when they get home from work after a long day, they wanna get home and do their research. And if they're interested in investing in single family properties in Miami or just investing in real estate in Miami, and you're posting blog after blog after blog about that, you're more likely to pop up in the rankings and they're gonna find your blog, they're gonna read you in the comfort of their own home in their comfy couch with their blanket on them all cozy and your stuff's going right in. It's bypassing their wall. When they go to a networking event, they know they're gonna get sold to. They know people are gonna to come to them and try and pitch them shit. There's a wall up. They're putting a wall up. They're, they're intently looking for people to screw them. When they're in the comfort of their own home, it just goes right in, right through the wall, okay? So I want you to write 10 blogs while you specialize in. Promise me, I promise you this, was, this is gonna work. So that's the first thing we do. Second thing we do is we put it into a book. After you have 10 blogs, you wanna compile it in a way that you can put it in a book. Maybe it'll be Single Family Guide to Investing in Miami. Maybe that, that, that's the book. You can think of a, a, a better title, more sexy title, but that's basically what you're gonna do. You're gonna compile all those blogs, all the information you've already written, and you're gonna start a website too. You can start a free website. Again, I can't spend too much time on this because I, I could spend six hours just on this and I did, like I said, in the course below, so you can get all that. But I show you exactly how to set up your website. How to, I show you everything, dude. Don't worry about it. So, but, but then you write a book. You put these blogs that you already wrote, because now you're probably thinking like, Matt, how can I write a book? I just can't write a book. You already did. You already wrote the book when you wrote the 10 blogs about what you specialize in. Now you're going to compile it in a way. You put it into a free PDF. Okay, so now, now you're an author. Holy shit. This is exactly what I did. I was a 23 year old author. I had like three books. Cause I, we just moved out of our parents' house. I was working as a carpenter. I'd come home and I'd write blogs and books. This is what my marketing coach told me 10, 20, 10, 20, 10, 15 years ago when I started with him. Um, write all these blogs. And then I thought, well, I might as well put it into a book. And I pitched him. I was like, hey, do you think I should write a book? And he was like, fuck yeah, like, that's a great idea. So I put them all into a book and now I'm an author, so my email signature and everywhere on my marketing, it's Matt Pichet slash author. Whoa, right? It, it worked really well 10 years ago. It'll still work well now, but it worked really well back then. Um, so people were like, holy shit, you have a book? And I was like, yeah, man, go on my website, give me a free book. People were like, no way. So they get the free book, 
Now they're like, dang, like this guy has a book. Like that's crazy. Even though it was just like a fucking PDF. It's like a crappy PDF I made, but technically I was an author. So people were like, man, authority. And this is the key theme to all of this is you want to be an authority. Just like I said, when you're specializing and you're an expert, you're a high caliber person, it's the next level, people trust you. Again, an example I always use is if you broke your foot, would you rather go to a foot doctor that operates on feet every single day? They know exactly how to fix your foot. Two seconds, they'll fix your foot. Or would you rather go get surgery from, from a general doctor who did go to med school for sure? They know the foot mechanics, like they'll do a good job on your foot. But that foot doctor that does feet every single day, they're gonna, you're gonna walk out of there perfectly in like three days. Maybe not, but you get what I'm saying. You wanna go with the foot doctor, obviously, the specialist. That's what you have to do with your real estate investing business because that foot doctor is an authority in the foot industry. Whatever, that, whatever doctor that, that's called, I don't know. But you wanna be an authority when it comes to investing in real estate in a specific niche and we do that from social media clout. This is the new way. Doctors do it with a med school degree. We do it with social media clout. Okay, so we write the 10 blogs on our website, we write the book, and now what we do is email marketing. We set up an email marketing campaign so that on the website, right, I'm sure you've been to tons of these, on the website, blah, 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 get my free book, enter your email, and I'll send you my free book, okay? Where do you think that goes? So people want the book, they go to the website, they want the book, now they get logged onto your email website program, and now you have their email, and you can email them constantly, after this, but you're not gonna email them crap, okay? So you're gonna email them great, great quality tips from the blogs. So maybe you have 10 blogs that you could pull out pieces and each blog could be like three mini emails, right? You're gonna recompile it. I know it's some work, but it's not a lot of work because you've already written all the blogs. You're just compiling them different for the book. You're compiling them a little different for the email. So if you have 10 blogs, that could be easily 50 emails. And you're gonna do 50, you're gonna set up automatically 50 emails, just little tips. Just little, little tips. So what we're doing here is soft touches. We're giving, we're giving, we're giving, and people eventually are gonna ask or you're gonna ask later in the email. So you're gonna build your list, they're gonna get free emails every week, just a little tip, free. So, so, so they're happy and they're like, sweet, I'm getting free tips. You're not emailing them crap and trying to sell them bullshit, not yet. <laughs> so you're gonna email them free tips and after a couple of free tips, you're gonna say, hey, by the way, you know, I'm looking for more partners and we do this indirect and I bust this down in the course so detailed, but we say like, we just indirect sell it. We soft sell is what I say. So, hey, by the way, you know, I'm looking for more partners in Miami, Florida. We got a couple great deals that we're looking at. If you're interested, just, just let me know, man. Just like simple, 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 just a soft touch. Maybe they won't act on the first one. More free tips, more free tips, more free tips. And then we ask again on the 19th email. Hey, by the way, I'm still looking for, for more partners. We got some great deals going on here. I'm looking for more money partners. If you're interested, let me know, man. More free tips, more free tips, more free tips. And then we ask again, you see what I'm saying? Eventually, you're gonna hook someone. Now, the key thing to all of this marketing is, this is what my business coach told me uh, when I started with him. And I was like, I didn't get it at the time. I was like 22 years old. I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? But he said, marketing, Matt, is a moving parade. I was like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. He said, People want to follow someone for a long time, potentially before they even act on what they're saying. So what he means is people are following your journey like a parade. They're following you, following you, following you. They might not jump on the parade now, but maybe they will later. So for example, someone sees my video on YouTube, they're like, dang, this guy knows what he's talking about. That was an entertaining video. I'm going to subscribe to his channel and we'll see what he, what he does next. Then they follow me, follow me for like six months. I'm posting videos every single week about my specialty, what I invest in. I'm posting, posting my blogs, posting my videos. And he says, I'd like to invest with Matt, but I'm not ready yet. You know, I gotta sell my house or, you know, whatever happens in my life, that person might not have the money today. But if you just threw up your hands and said, I did this marketing thing, like Matt said, I wrote 10 blogs, I wrote a book, nobody cared, I'm done with real estate investing, Matt was wrong. You didn't get the point. People were following you, and that's the key thing. When you write blogs on your social media, on your YouTube, people are following you. Just because they might not email you right away doesn't mean they won't email you ever. They're just following and waiting, and something in their life changes. Maybe they come into money, maybe they do sell their primary residence at some point, now, now they have a lot of equity, or whatever. Something happens in their life where now they have the money, and because they were following you for the past 
six months, a year, two years, now they're ready to jump on the parade. But if you were to stop marketing, because you said, screw this, it's not working, you would have lost all that hard work you did, it's gone. This is exactly what happened to me for my entire career. I had people still to this day who message me, DM me, and say, Matt, I wanna partner with you. Dude, I've been following you for two years, three years, four years, but now I'm ready to go. I, I came in to some money, I sold the property, now I have some money, let's do this thing, baby. That happens all the time. But if I were to just stop marketing, I would have lost them. They would have moved on to somebody else and they would have marked, sold with them, right? So that's, this is the sequence we do. And last but not least, I kind of gave it away. We do the videos. On what? What do you think? The 10 blogs, the books, the email marketing tip you have. You have so much content now to do videos. So whatever you wrote a blog on, we're gonna redo that blog that you wrote in written form. We're gonna now shoot it in video form. Now I know you guys are thinking, Matt, I can't do videos like you. You're, you're doing videos, you're used to it. Videos are the absolute most important thing in order for you to grow your business and capture joint venture partners. It is the most important thing. Videos hands down, why? When you're on a TV screen like I am right now, a TV screen or a monitor screen, whatever, or your phone screen, there's a huge level of authority. Even though in 2022 you're used to it because you watch tons of videos, you see people on TV all the time or whatever. It's not, it's not anything cool, but it is in the back of the mind. Someone on a screen like this teaching and having an authority standpoint telling you something automatically makes it more likely that they're an expert and an authority, which is what we want. So there's this like TV effect, this, this fame effect, okay? Now I can go back to that thing I said about property managers, about how they gave me good deals because I'm famous. Remember that shitty joke I made like an hour ago? <laughs> okay, because of my social media and because of my branding, I get a lot of incentives or I meet cool people that I would never have met uh, before. I get deals thrown at me from property managers, contractors, suppliers, whatever. This, what I'm telling you right here, isn't only for joint venture attraction, which is awesome because it helps us build our business. You get so many other benefits you have no friggin' idea from doing this and building a brand, which is what we're doing, a, a, an authority brand. So don't forget that. So that's how we get good deals on property management. That's how we get realtors dying to work with us. Wholesaler is dying to work with us because they see us on YouTube and go, man, I, I can never do what you're doing because I'm willing to put in the fucking work. And most people are not putting in the work. So if you can put in the work and do these videos and write the blogs, I'm telling you, it's a lot of work up front, I get it. But if you're willing to do it, you're gonna stand out. Nobody's willing to do this. This fucking two to three hour thing I'm doing for, for you here. Nobody wants to do this, but I'll do it. Okay, so that's why I get all these benefits and I track partners and I build my business, okay? So we do, the, we do the videos, like I said, absolutely important. Now, going back to what I said, I know you're probably scared, like, Matt, I can't do videos, I'm awkward, I'm weird. Dude, go to the beginning of my channel right now, go to the first videos, watch that video, and then watch this video and see how I'm acting now. I was stiff as a board, I was scared shitless, the video was terrible, I was reading a script on, on the wall, in my crappy condo, okay? Like, <laughs> you just get used to it. My first video was awful. Your first videos are gonna be terrible, I promise you. They'll be awful, but we can laugh about it later, 10 years later, I promise you. It doesn't matter. Even the awkward video got me partners. I had 300 subscribers, I think 200 subscribers on my YouTube when I got my first partner. It's like you don't need this massive subscriber list to, to gain authority. Just being and showing up on YouTube and showing up on social media elevates you that much more. I was already like a multi-millionaire when I had like 2,000 subscribers on YouTube. So you don't need this like crazy giant list or like this clout. Just a little clout is good enough, okay? So don't worry about that. Do the videos. Uh, that's the formula right there. Okay, so we got the formula, the blogs, write the book, do the email marketing. In order to get the book, you gotta get the email marketing. So you email them the book and then you're gonna keep them in, in check with all the videos. But how do we keep them in check on a daily basis? and a less pressured basis on like, get my book, you know, go to my website, get my book. You're asking a lot from someone. So how do we get someone to go there? Social media. This is your best friend starting now. If you're not on social media, I'm sure you are, but are you on it as a real estate investor? Now you are. Okay, so let's go over each of the most popular platforms and how you market on there in depth. Again, like I said in my course, Unlimited Cash Below, I go through each of these in huge detail and how to market on each one specifically. I'm gonna go over quick to give you a little taste. On Facebook, this is really great for long form content and small form. 
both long form and short form content. So what I mean by that is like a quick little video or a quick little write up. If Facebook is kind of like a catch all platform, I'm gonna write that here. Because you can, like the blogs you wrote, you can post that on your Facebook and say, hey, hey everyone, I just wrote a blog on the top five reasons to invest in Florida, in Miami, uh, single family properties, check it out. And you, and you link it and you throw it up on there. People check it out, oh sweet, and they comment, sweet, right? So you can throw your blog, you, you shoot a video, you put the video on there. Hey guys, here's a video on Miami, Florida. Post the video on Facebook. You can do a little, uh, and what's also good is like picture updates. So if you're, if you're at a property and with a realtor, you take a picture of the property you're at and you say, just checking out a property with my realtor, post it on Facebook, people go, oh cool, right? So you're just throwing everything on Facebook and I, I go in, into this in huge detail. I'm not gonna give you all the detail because it's not fair for people who bought the course, but I, I teach you exactly how to market on this. But Facebook is a more casual, slash business kind of platform. So I want you to show personal stuff because you are a human being. <laughs> so spending time with your kids, right? You're at the park with your kids and then you might say something or post something. This is a picture of your daughter on a swing, let's say, right? And you, and you say, I'm so glad that I get to leave work at three instead of five every day because I invest in single family properties here in Miami. And it, it produces, it gives me income that I don't have to work as much. That's it. That's the post right there. That was a huge seller and you don't even realize the impact that has. You didn't say anything in that Facebook post about if you want to retire, partner with me because I'm the best. It's too, too strong. Remember, we want to do a soft sell. We want to do an indirect sell. There's a direct sell, which is like a, a commercial. Buy this Dodge Ram for this price. That, that, that's a direct sell. We don't want to do that. That's 1990s, remember? We want to do an indirect. Indirect means we're hitting the pain point of someone because 23 year old me, if I, was, if I was on your Facebook list and you posted about your daughter and how you get to you know, uh, leave work two hours early, I'd be like, I don't fucking care. Like I'm 23 years old. I don't, I'm not thinking about daughters and stuff like that. So that message would just fly right past my head. Like I would see your picture and be like, oh, that's nice. He gets to push the swing on, or his daughter on a swing. But the message you said would just go right over my head. The 41 year old guy on your Facebook group who's like, I want to spend more time with my daughter how come he gets to leave at five? I have to work till five, he gets to leave at three. That message would go right to my heart. If I was a 41 year old guy or a 41 year old wife and I saw that Facebook thing, you just saying, I'm so happy I get to spend more time with my daughter and pick her up at three every day instead of five because our investment business here in Miami is doing so well. That's it, that's, that's, that's the hook, that's it. You, you don't realize the power of those little things. And those are the things I'm saying in the videos all the time. I think I've said them in this video. If you're paying attention, I kind of just did. I'm saying these things all the time and the people watching the videos don't even realize it right to the heart. They don't realize what I'm saying. I'm not saying you should partner with me and kiss her Waterloo because I'm the best and everybody sucks. Sometimes I say that, but mostly I'm saying these little drops. I get to travel and go to Bali whenever the hell I want because a real estate investing business is awesome and gives us the time and the money to travel all we want. The 50 per year old person who doesn't want to travel, again, they see my post and go, that's nice, but it doesn't really get them. The 41 year old guy who says, I want to travel with my kids and do stuff right to the heart. I want to invest with Matt. It's like, an indirect, it's like I'm hypnotizing them. It's like, it's like a hypnotic thing, okay? So that's what we're doing. We're doing indirect selling. That's the key to all of this. And how you indirect sell is just talking about your business and the benefits that it gives you and hopefully the ideal joint venture partner on the other side of the screen also resonates with what you're saying. That's all I'm doing. That's all you have to do. Sorry about that guys, the battery died. I don't know where exactly we left off, but I think we ended off right at the Instagram portion. So like I always say, Instagram is the most narcissistic social media platform on there. So this is more where you wanna brag about what you're doing. So you wanna post the same kind of things, especially the personal side of it. So hanging with your family, but like I said, remember on Facebook how we're saying, I'm so happy I get to spend time with my daughter, I get to pick her up. Okay, those kind of things on Instagram absolutely kill way more because everybody's going to Instagram to basically peep on other people's lives, see what they're doing, and they expect the bragging, they expect the showing off. So it's cool to do that on Instagram, it's expected and encouraged. So we can be a little more personal. What I really love to do the most on Instagram, my biggest uh, strategy here is this Insta stories. So it's not even so much the posting. So when we post our videos or whatever on YouTube, which we'll get to in a sec, we can post the little clips on Facebook or Instagram, which is cool, 
but the real powerful marketing thing here is the Insta story. So um, showing what you're doing like minute by minute. That's what Instagram is really made about. So if you're seeing a property with your realtor, it's really cool to uh, say like, I'm seeing this property with my realtor, you know, I'm checking this property out and that, that's one Insta story. Um, and then you're gonna see when you get home and you're analyzing properties, you're gonna post that as a story. And when you're eating your dinner, you're gonna post that as a story. You're mixing business with personal all the time and that's really, really cool because people get to see who you are, what you're doing, how you live as a real estate investor, how you live as a father or a mother or whatever. It's all commingled, but with a slight dose of bragging of like, look at me, I get to do all these cool things. I get to travel to this resort in Mexico, all paid for by my tenants, baby. Like you're posting those kind of things and it does so well. And like I said, if that's what your ideal joint venture partner wants is more travel, more time with their wife and kid or husband, and you're posting how you get to spend all your time with your kid and husband, thanks to real estate, we're dropping the real estate in there. That's what really hooks people and they really wanna invest with you, okay? So that's that. Last but not least, I can go on for all the other ones, but only in the free video, uh, YouTube. So on YouTube, absolutely amazing. This is really the teaching. I'm just gonna write that, because that's all it is. And long form, very, very long form. So like this, <laughs> maybe not this long, but people on YouTube expect long form. The, the key for YouTube is 10 minutes. People love 10 minute videos. I'm breaking my own rule here because I'm just doing this as a marketing technique and I'm gonna see if it's gonna work. I don't know. I've done a lot of 30 minute videos, a lot of 40 minute videos. So I said to Tyler, my social media manager, fuck it. I'm gonna do a three hour video, six hour. We'll see how long it is, I don't know. And we'll see how it does. This video might flop. I might have wasted three hours and the three hours it took to, for me to prepare this video. I don't know, but that's marketing. We're split testing, we're trying, we're trying things out. But on YouTube, it's long form content and the the main thing is teaching. So we're not really sharing too much necessarily about our personal life. It's not like we're updating our kids' first birthday video, or you know what I mean, first birthday party. We're not doing that kind of stuff, maybe a little bit, but um, it's more so teaching. We're up here on YouTube for the purpose of uh, attracting joint venture partners, and how we do that is through teaching. So if I'm investing in Miami, Florida, single family properties, you better believe I'm making video after video after video, teaching and, be and better yet, showing. So when I'm buying my properties, um, I'm showing the before and after. Remember how I said before we buy a property, once it's locked up, we bring the contractor through, we set up our insurance, stuff like that. We do the before video. So, so important. And so many of my coaching clients I talk to, and I'm like, yo, you've closed like 30 deals. Have you done before pictures? And they're like, no, I just kind of did the property. I was like, no way, dude. So much content. You want to do before and after videos, especially here on YouTube. Absolute authority. There's nothing more authoritative than showing the before and after of a renovation and then being like, see what I did? And then slightly dropping it. If you want to partner with me in Miami, Florida, hit me up. That's it. That's all you have to do for selling after you've shown the video and shown your proof. And that's why this indirect selling works so good. It's because it's easy for introverts like myself to grasp it because I don't really, surprisingly, I really don't like selling people or like, you know, doing all the tricks and like forcing people to buy my stuff. Or it's just, it doesn't come natural to me. What does come natural to me, thankfully, is teaching and then asking for the sale or asking for the uh, partnership after I've given them free content and given them something that's there. And then I, I just drop it there. Like, hey, if you want to invest in me in Kitchener, just, just let me know. Like, that's enough. So basically, you can be a shitty salesperson but because you've given so much free content and you've gained someone's trust, even you having a crappy sales ask at the end is enough to lock people up. So that's why I love that. What you, what you wanna do really when all said and done, the key thing to this is sell the lifestyle. Lifestyle and the dream. That's all, that's our whole social media strategy in a nutshell. We're showing the lifestyle of being a real estate investor slash mom slash husband slash whatever. And we're selling the dream of one day I get to retire at age 40 instead of everybody else at age 66, 68, 69, whatever. And I get to spend all of that time with my lovely kids. Thanks to real estate investing. That's the whole thing right there. Anyway, I hope you guys have tons of, con tons of uh, stuff on that. Now we're gonna go over to how to build a flip business. All right, so we're talking about flip business because a lot of you, uh, I want to throw this in there because you, you want to do the flips. I know they're sexy, they're cool, they can make a ton of money and they definitely can. So I want to throw this in here as the last section of this video. I thought about not doing it, but I want you guys to learn how to flip because 
it is key. I don't want you to flip at the beginning, especially if you're a new investor, not yet, but eventually soon I wanna show you my business, uh, how it looks, how the empire works, so that you're at least aware of it so you can plan for it for the future. But for the flips, here's the, the thing of all of this is that it must, absolute must be a deal. It absolutely cannot be an okay deal. It can't be most times an MLS deal because MLS deals are fair market value. Generally, it's a fair deal, right? On, on the market with a realtor, no realtor is gonna like sell a deal at a low, low discount. Sometimes it happens because that realtor might not know the market or they, you know, but it's, it's rare. We have to go back to the wholesaler, like I said at the beginning. Remember the wholesaler who goes direct to seller and, do, and they, they, they do the marketing? I'm gonna show you exactly what that marketing looks like and how you get these deals. But first and foremost, it absolutely must be a deal. And I'll show you my formula here for buying deals. So this can go for MLS deals, but it's likely not gonna happen for you. <laughs> but for the off-market deals, for flipping specifically, this is how we break down deals. We don't do the breakdowns like we did with the single family home about the mortgage payments and the taxes. and We don't really care about that stuff because we're flipping it. What we do care about is the purchase price. So how we do this, if you follow me on YouTube, you know this. So we go, uh, man, I've been going on for too long. My brain's going to mush. Okay, so we take the ARV, the after repair value, times 80% minus Reno's equals purchase price. I'm gonna do double P, purchase price. So what this means is I need to know, being an expert, that the after repair value, what, what it's gonna be worth when I'm done, I, I, need, I need to know that number. I'm gonna times it by 80%. Why? I'm taking 20% out of the deal. Why? 5% is gonna to go to the realtor most likely. 5% is gonna to go towards financing and costs and stuff like that. And 10% ideally is my profit as a flipper. That's generally how that works, but I haven't renovated it yet. So I'm gonna minus the renovations from that price, which is gonna give me my max purchase price. Now let's see how this works in real time. I'm gonna grab my phone because I wasn't smart and I put these numbers down because I just thought of this on the fly. Okay, so if I know the house is gonna be worth when I'm done with it, 600K, let's say. When I'm done renovating a fruitful style, it's gonna be worth 600 grand. I already know that being an expert in my area, remember? So 600 grand times 0.80%, that gives me 480. I'll just keep that there, right? So I times it by 80%, 0.80 in mathematic terms. And I haven't renovated it yet, right? So I know if I need to make this house look sweet and be worth 600K when I'm done, I'm gonna have to put in 100K because this house really sucks that I'm seeing. The floors are terrible, it needs a new kitchen, it needs new everything. So I know it's gonna cost me 100 grand to make it look sweet. So I'm gonna minus 100 grand, which tells me my max purchase price is $380,000. So if I'm gonna buy a potentially 600K house when I'm done with it, and it needs 100K right now, I gotta buy it at 380K. So that's, that's a rough number. So this isn't like a tried and true thing, by the way. You don't buy property solely on this formula, but it's a, almost like 99% correct. Once you agree on this price and you tell it to the seller and the seller says, yep, I get it, I agree. Okay, before you sign the contract, just yet, now you go home on your spreadsheet and you actually put in the cost. How many months is it gonna uh, take for renovations and holding costs? You know, calculate your financing because financing a flip, you're probably using private money, which is way more expensive. You're paying 12%, 13%, 17% potentially for private money, okay? So it's way more expensive. So you're gonna do all the costs, the renovation costs, the realtor costs to sell, lawyer fees to purchase and sell. You're gonna do all these costs on the spreadsheet and then you're gonna say, does 380 work? I bet you it will, by the way. But, uh, and then you agree to the price with the seller. But nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, if you buy a property based on this formula, it's gonna work really, really, really well for a flip. So I'm not gonna get too much into like breaking down the flip, the exact numbers, because that's a whole course in itself, but I'm at least showing you nine, 90% of how to get there in this video. We can go deeper on private coaching sessions or uh, other courses I have. By the way, that was an indirect sell. If you didn't notice, okay, I'm doing it too. Okay, so, so Matt, how do we build this uh, funnel? How do we get these motivated sellers? How do we even find motivated sellers? Now we're gonna get into that right now. So the key to find these motivated, and by the way, an MLS seller would never agree to this. Never agree to this. That, that's the thing, right? That's why we have to go off market direct to seller. You will never find this deal on MLS. I can almost guarantee it. Unless we're in a crazy recession and the world's going nuts, which we might get there. 
who knows, but I doubt it. On MLS, I doubt it. Okay, so the people you need to hire and the system you need to do, before I do that, so it's all about marketing. We need to market to the sellers. And like I said earlier in the video, um, it's all about, like the wholesalers and the way we do this, it's, it's all the same. We're sending out the flyers. You've already seen them before in your house. I guarantee it. The flyer that says, we buy houses, all cash, no commission, screw realtors, right? You've seen those before. So we're sending those out. And then we're also uh, doing online ads. It could be Facebook ads, Google ads, Instagram ads which uh, I can't go into that in great detail in this video, but there's a, a very key way on how we do that. But essentially, I'll give it to you real quick, in a nutshell anyway. So we have the flyer, terrible flyer. <laughs> so we have, I buy houses, all cash, realtors are the worst, sell your house to me, right? And what you wanna do is have the website at the bottom, www.ibuyhouses.com. I'm giving too much away here, because like my competitors could be watching this, and oh well, who cares? Um, Wholesalers never, ever, ever put their friggin' website on the bottom of the flyer. I don't know why. It's some bullshit handwritten flyer too that looks terrible with no website. So <laughs> you're asking for sketchy sketch. So the seller is like, who the hell is this? I'm not selling my house to this person. But that is a strategy because that, that's what the wholesalers want. Because whoever does respond to that piece of shit flyer must be very, very motivated, okay? But I go a step further. My flyers look really nice, pretty fancy and I put my website on. Reason is, most people won't sell their house to someone based on a shitty flyer, right? They want to dig more and see who is this person. So by putting my website at the bottom, and I have a website over here, I got my website, I got my app before and after videos, I got testimonials from sellers, I got my process on the website, whatever. Now they go to the website and they check me out. I'm gaining more authority, I'm hopefully gaining more trust, they're learning more about me. But what the key is, when I do my Facebook ads, right? I have a cookie set up on my website, if you know what that is. It basically means when somebody goes to my website, they get dinged. And the internet goes, that person came to this guy's website, I'm gonna feed them more information from that guy's website, which is my Facebook ads. It's creepy. Facebook is creepy, but I'm using it to my advantage, right? So, so I get a cookie on it, and then my Facebook ads go, oh, that person visited this guy's website. And this guy, me, has ads, you know, like, I'll buy your house, I'll buy your house. I have like three ads, let's say, right? Now, this person who went here, they're gonna see all my ads. They're gonna get spammed with my ads on their social media feed. So now, they've seen me on a flyer in their house, they've been to my website, and now they're seeing me on their Facebook? It's like I'm following them everywhere, and I am. So now, I'm more trustworthy to them and they wanna to sell to me more likely because they're seeing me in their house, they saw me on the website, and now they're seeing me in the comfort of their home on Facebook and Instagram. Amazing. Just because I had the website on the flyer. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say. That was, I actually gave way too much info there. Um, so, how do we set this up, the process? First up, we hire an acquisition manager. My purple light just died, that sucks. My battery, my camera died, the lights died. Oh well, we're almost done. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we got the acquisition manager. This is absolutely important uh, because this person takes all of my phone calls and all of my stuff. So, so I send out the flyers, I pay for them anyway. I, I send them all up, I send them out, I send out the Facebook ads, great. I just pay every month, right? My acquisition manager is the one who screens the calls, screen calls, and closes the deals. So. When I started off this business, I would actually go to the house, visit with the sellers, try and close the deal myself, and I was pretty good at it. I mean, I am a realtor, I'm a good salesman, I know how to close the deals. However, I'm more of an entrepreneur and an investor than I am really a salesperson, even as a realtor. I'm not really pushy-pushy, I'm just offering the value, I'm offering the service, and if you wanna sell, fantastic, Like we'll, we'll make the deal happen, right? But with the uh, uh, sellers, I was too pushy, for example. When I went to my meetings with the sellers, my meetings would be about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, maybe. When I went there, I would meet them, walk the house, show them my process, offer them the offer, and be like, hey, do you wanna sell or not? And I got some good deals, right, for sure. But my acquisition manager, he's built for this. He's built to be a salesman, and he just crushes it. So when I said my meetings were 15 minutes, when he goes to these meetings, when the calls come in, which I don't take anymore, he, he takes all of them. Um, his meetings are minimum two hours. Two hours! 
What he's talking about, I have no friggin' idea. I don't know what he's talking about for two hours. But he's building trust, he's building rapport, he's becoming their friend, and then at the very end when he asks for the sale and gives our low, low offer, they're way more likely to accept it. So he's really good at it. So that what I'm saying is you need to hire an acquisition manager to take all the phone calls, to go to the meetings, to close the deals, because you're too busy raising money and growing your business. Remember, that's your job as a real estate investor, is to raise money, do the YouTube videos, do the blogs, write the books, that's your job. Okay, let the other people do what they're good at. So the acquisition manager is amazing at that. He handles all that. Um, you're probably thinking, Matt, how do you pay them though? Like, I don't have money. I'm just starting my business. You know, in a couple years when I start flipping, I still won't have that much money to hire someone. Here's the, here's the good thing. The acquisition manager is paid on commission only. Okay, so we can work that out a bunch of ways. Um, you can find out online. I'll make a course on this very soon, but there's a million ways to pay your person but I pay them commission how much, I won't say, because it's personal information to my business, but you pay them based on how good the deal is, essentially. So they're only getting paid if they're closing deals for you. So it's not like you're paying someone $40 an hour, 100 bucks an hour, whatever, and then they're not closing deals, and you're like, oh my God, I'm just bleeding money, right? You're only paying them when they close the deals. You can hire this person immediately. Why not? If they close the deal, you only pay them based on how good you made the money on the deal, right? So it's, it's great. Um, so that's great for that. So. Hire someone who's really good at this. Absolutely important. Um, next up, we have a project manager to do your flips. So this person, you have to pay hourly, there's no commission. I mean, you could do commission for this one, but this is most likely a paid by the hour role. So a project manager, uh, you're paying them. I don't know, I, I pay my, oh, I won't say how much I pay mine. <laughs> Anywhere between 25 to $40 an hour is a pretty good wage, right? So. Pay someone there um, and they run all the jobs. So again, I'm not taking all the phone calls from all the leads coming in. Remember, I'm setting up the Facebook ads, I'm setting up the back end because I'm an entrepreneur, that's what I'm good at, and I'm hiring key people in key roles. So I'm not taking any of the phone calls, I'm not going to any of the meetings, I'm not negotiating at all with the sellers, my acquisition manager takes all the phone calls. The only time I hear from him is when we close the deal. So he's out there working, he's taking phone calls every day, he's calling people back, he's doing all, doing all that. I only hear from him when he says, Matt, we just bought a house. Sweet! That's the only time I hear from him. It's fantastic. That side of the business, totally automated. The project manager, she runs all the jobs for me as well. So when we close the deal, even before that, remember how I said we gotta order all the materials, order all the flooring, the taps, the sinks, etc. She does all of that before we close. So I don't even do any of that either. So she does that, she sets up all the trades, sets them up, gets the quotes, we have employees, she runs the employees, she pays the employees, she does all of that. She goes to the job through the process every single couple of days or once a week, checks in on the job, checks on the guys, see how they're going, et cetera, et cetera. Runs the whole renovation. I don't know anything about the renovation at all until it's done. And then I go and I shoot the after video with my social media manager. We shoot the, the after video, uh, we do all that. So that whole thing is totally automated as well. Uh, and last but not least, do I have any more here? No, nope, that is it. Last but not least, we have the funds manager, which is optional, but I would highly recommend it, especially um, the bigger you get. So the, my funds manager raises all my money. Raises all the money and deals with all the contracts and all stuff like that. So we have an email list for people who want a private line to us. Uh, so I would recommend doing that. This is why learning how email list is very, very important. So we have an email list. So whenever I buy a deal, I blast the email list. Hey, we just bought a house on 123 Main Street. If you want to partner with me, let me know, right? So people email me back. Yep, I want to partner with you. I want to uh, lend money to you. So he does all that. I don't do any of that. I just tell him, hey, we bought a house. I put it in our, in our system, our, our organizer online. Um, he sees that I bought a house. It's closing 30 days from now. He goes, oops, we got to raise the money. It's 30 days from now, great. So he emails the list. Or buying house one two three Main Street, he writes it all up. I don't do that anymore. He blasts the list. Um, people email back, and then he he signs the contract with them. He does all that. He accepts the money in my bank account. He does all of that. I don't do any of that. And then because we have so many flips on the go, this is the thing. I don't have time to do all this. I'm doing the videos here. I'm running a couple of other businesses. I'm doing lots of stuff. I don't have time to remember who I'm paying and when because it's very important to pay your lenders on time, right? Everybody wants their, their money on time. I would lose too much track. And this is what all so many flippers do. They're trying to do everything themselves. I don't know why they don't hire a funds manager. 
25, 30, 35 bucks an hour, whatever you want to do. Um, it's not that much. And he accepts the money, signs the contract, make sure it's all done. Every month we got to pay the people. We have a system, it's all scheduled. He pays them on time. I don't do any of that. So the money is going out of my account, coming into my account. He does all of that. So very, very important. Your three top hires, I would say, for your flip business are the acquisition manager. He's, this is the most, this is the top of the pyramid. This is how this kind of works. The acquisition manager here is top of the pyramid. He's the most important because if you're not closing deals, they're not feeding the rest of your employees, right? If you have no flips going on, your project manager's out of a job. And so is your funds manager. They're out of a job. And your employees, the last one, I, we already talked about it though, but your carpenter employees, they're out of a job. So this person is the most important person in your whole business for the flip side. They're closing the deals, great. Then the project manager sets them all up, orders all the materials, schedules all the contractors, fantastic. Your funds manager raises the money, pays all the lenders, fantastic. Your employees do the renovations. Bing, bang, boom. This is the flip pyramid. I'm gonna trademark this, I think, pretty soon. But I want to go over the flip business pretty quickly because I know a lot of you love flipping. You see me flip and I absolutely love it. It is my main, main, main uh, business strategy at this point when it comes to real estate investing. We are branching out to do more Airbnbs as well in Florida, like I said earlier. But the flips is really where it's at. But like I said, it's only really an advanced strategy, only for advanced investors. Don't do it. What I always say is you don't want to flip uh, until you're at least a $2 million net worth. So do the buy and holds, grind, grind, grind with the buy and holds until you're at a $2 million net worth, then maybe start thinking about flipping. Because, reason why I say two million, because in order to get here, you've done a lot, probably. You probably have over 10 rental properties, which means you've done 10 renovations, you've probably gone through shitty contractors, you've gone through all the stuff that you're gonna go through, most likely. So you've been through it, you know the system, you, you get it. And two million also as well, because if you do have a flip that goes bad, at least you have some money to cover your ass. Um, if, you if you start flipping, and this has happened recently right now with the uh, market going down so quick, I know a lot of people who were newer to flipping, unfortunately, and they lost money. The markets went down, they lost money, and they didn't have a net worth to fall on. You know, we had a couple of flips going on at the time of the market really tanking, and we have two deals right now that we're kind of stuck with. It pisses me off, for sure, but like, we're gonna sell them eventually, but I can weather the storm and hold them, because I have so much cash flow for my business, I have so much of, of a net worth. Two properties for me, no big deal. It pisses me off at night, for sure, but like, I'm not gonna go under and screw my partner, screw my lenders, or screw myself. I'll be fine. I'll just, it'll just piss me off a bit. But because I have that big net worth, I can eat it a little bit. But if you're a newer investor and something like that happens to you, man, you could literally go bankrupt, lose your shirt, ruin your name in the real estate investing business, not good. So by waiting until you're at this level, like I said, you have experience, but you also have money to fall on should something go bad and it not work out your way. So that's that. This is the business model for flipping. Um, like I said, this is great. Flipping is, is amazing more of an advanced strategy, I hope you do it. I've been running on here for, I don't know, almost three hours, I feel like. My mouth is dry. I hope you learned something. If you did, that would be amazing if you smashed the like button. Also smash the subscribe button, it would really appreciate it because the more subscribers I get, the more likes I get, the more this channel gets boosted, and the more it energizes me to keep making these videos. And also, we put out two financial and real estate videos every single week. So if you like this video, subscribe, and I will see you in the next shorter video.